question. Do you guys do, do you do comedy at all anymore? No, God, no. I haven't done comedy in uh, like probably six, seven, oh, like eight, nine years, something like that. Well, you like did that. That, that one that one off that yeah, was yeah. fucking brilliant yeah, I did the uh, yeah the uh, the Ballad of Mr. Hands that was a song I wrote all about the guy who got fucked to death by a horse <laughs> uh, so I did that and then that was and then that was it but that was like yeah seven seven or eight years ago so I haven't haven't even I've thought about it I've, that I've, was seven years ago yeah that was a while ago and I've uh, I've I've had ideas like I had an idea I I kind of if I, I thought if I ever do comedy again I know what I'm going to do like I know exactly that the set I want to do and uh, but like it's not gonna it's probably not gonna ever happen so but we'll see but and Garrett you're still sorry you're still doing it you're not doing it anymore you not said really years, I mean no. like I write stuff down still and I think about like oh yeah this would probably not go over that well so then I don't <laughs> don't bother trying talk myself out of it is that the repetition like the muscle memory that you kind of retain from doing it all the time. Like you just do it kind yeah, of more inherently. or less like it's yeah, it's hard not to like it's it's a really it's a drag in a way to not just be able to enjoy something organically to not just laugh at a thought without feeling like, oh, I got to hold on to it in some way. But mm-hmm. I still do. Well, or, it's like having podcasts, right? Like there's mm-hmm. how, so many times Dave, who's not uh, going to be here, but uh, like so many times I'll be hanging out with Dave and I'm just like, ah, fuck, we should have uh, we should have saved that for the podcast. And in my recorded. mind, I'm like, ah, oh, fuck yeah. you, man. Like, why are you thinking like that? You know, like, <laughs> yeah. just enjoy your life. Don't think about the podcast. The shit will come out. So. Well, uh, for everybody listening right now, it sound, it may sound a little bit different. Uh, I, we've got this is my first Skype podcast. Um, of course, you're listening to the F word, and I'm actually not in the regular F word studio. I'm at Sean from the Story of You podcast studio. We just recorded uh, an episode for his. What was it called again? Uh, well, many things. Let me just make a few corrections there, real quick, before we yes, get too deep do. into it. This is not the Story of You studio. This is the the Goatsy Hole, as we like to the call goatsy it. The Goatsy Hole. This Ooh, is, I like that. Yeah, I'm live from the Goatsy Hole. Yeah, yeah. So uh, with the Goatsy guys with the yeah. Goatsy boys. Oh, uh, I think Goatsy boys. I think boys is already uh, claimed territory. I think oh, okay. we need to walk that one back. Is that a come town thing? Do alliteration. They? It is. Come so boys. Let's okay. Just, uh, uh, goatsy guys. We'll, we'll, we'll go our own road and yeah. All right. So yeah, with the Goatsy, goatsy guys. guys. We're, uh, we, the, the Garrett and I and, and our friend David host uh, the official Goatsy podcast. Right. And this is this is uh, the, the stinky shithole that we do it in. So Hey, it's, <laughs> it's a nice setup. Like you guys have the microphones on all the stands properly. Yeah, not like you. I do. Yeah. You've got a full setup. Not like I do. It's, it's good, <laughs> man. And if this, uh, the audio quality is sounding better then you'll know why because we're not in the regular studio. I'm taking notes, by the way. Perfect. I Please might, do. I might emulate. Like shit compared to what you're used to, listener. <laughs> yeah, and it'll be on a half second delay too, so. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, so we've got Garrett in Vancouver right now and he's Skyping in mm-hmm. and then I've got Sean with me. I did Hello. a podcast with Sean about a couple oh, months ago. Yes, uh, yeah, you did the story of you a few yep. months ago. Uh, very, and thank you again for coming on and sharing your story. Thanks for having uh, me. Check that out, episode, I don't know, 141 One. or something. 152. 152? Oh, shit, so. it wasn't even that long ago. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't that long. Yeah, 152. Yeah. Um, and then so we talked about uh, having – I wanted to get him back on mine on doing a deep dive. And uh, he brought up somebody by the name of Frank D'Angelo. Or D'Angelo. Or just D'An- D'Angelo. So, I mean, if you call his company brand's uh, phone number – Depending on who you talk to, it'll be D'Angelo Brands or D'Angelo Brands. So I don't think anybody knows. (laughs) So I don't think anybody knows is really a running theme with this guy. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. Oh, no? (laughs) There's some crown prosecutors and – Oh, right. On the legal side of things. <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, and we'll get the story to it. Is ba- it's big in scope. It's small in scope. It's it's fascinating. It is Scorsese. You're going to hear this, and you're going to go. You know what? The Irishman was small potatoes compared to what I'm about to tackle. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. Uh, I'm G, your host, and uh, we're coming to you live. I guess SAS Podcast Network with the Connexus Credit Union Yo. hashtag Money Talk. MoneyTalk.ca. We were just talking about it before, bringing it in. Yeah. Cash yeah, money yeah. millionaire. Connects. That's right. <laughs> uh, Eat my yeah. booty like groceries. There we go. Um, yeah. So we're going to be talking about Frank D'Angelo. Now, the closest person I can compare him to is Tommy Wiseau from the States. And by That's the fair. States, I mean, I don't know. Because I think you mentioned he's like a Tommy Wiseau of sorts. But – He's, I would say he's more talented than Tommy Wiseau. Oh, for sure. And more consistent. Absolutely. And more consistent. Yeah. I feel, I, I get where you're coming from with that, but I worry it would get the wrong type of people's hopes up to okay. hear that he's okay. like Tommy Wiseau. Okay. I think okay. if they were to see the kind of content he produces, it's far more middle of the road <laughs> than, like, it's not, 
it's it's strange and it has trademark elements and it's a uh, weirdly like low budget look despite a re- high like reported budget yeah shooting on but they're not Sony the same kind of crazy mm-hmm, mm-hmm. well and it's it's more the the fact that he's an enigma and for the you gentlemen mm-hmm. uh, and Dave Dave yeah it's kind of been a sort of middle of the road pursuit, a middle life pursuit of yours to try to uncover this guy. Uh, we just listened. I listened to the two albums for the one we just recorded. Two of 15 this. albums. Two yeah. of 15 albums. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you this guy, your toes. And- yeah. 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 I, you wet I, your beak on his music. You barely know? from what I understand. Uh, and it was interesting. That's a, that's a for sure. Oh yeah. Um, this guy started off as um, what may a brewery. Oh no! Well, I mean, we can go all the way. Back. I have notes on everything. You got we, notes. Okay, we can so go all the way back. Yeah, to you the probably start. have a better framework of his actual timeline. Okay. Do we want to like, go man. where how we discovered him though? Yeah. And what, what first we can got start us there. Into I mean, I was just going to say like more? this guy's gotten companies. He got music albums. Mm-hmm. He makes movies. Mm-hmm. He's got photos online with Al Pacino and other people. Goddamn right, Paul and Newman. Oh yeah, Paul Newman. With Pacino. He did interviews yeah. with Kissed him. The man, they they kiss each other on the cheek, both oh. cheeks. Like this guy is just the, the 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 just a very he's like an enigma of the Canadian landscape in a way. He's the hardest working man in Canadian show business, and yeah. nobody appreciates him in, bu- in Canadian business. True enough, yeah. And and I guess sorry, the question Jim, for is, living. I guess the question is, should you appreciate? <laughs> I, mean, I, signed, him? I just signed the petition to get him on Dragons. Then <laughs> did so you? We're up to two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just just a heads. Up, everybody out there, go to change.org. Look up. Uh, we have a petition that's been started it's to hard get hard to find. By the way, yeah, probably <laughs> it's on change.org. <laughs> we should put a link to it on our website. Uh, we have a, we, a petition to get Frank D'Angelo on Dragons. Then as one oh, of the ho- one of the one of the dragons. I feel oh, like as be one a of the actual yeah. dragons. Yeah, I feel like he'd be a good fit for that. Damn, mm-hmm. he'd be an excellent dragon. <laughs> Kevin O'Leary would cower. God, I'd love to, to see them spar. And he would. People would love that. People are waiting for Kevin O'Leary to get his comeuppance. Frank's the and guy. Frank would be the guy to give it to him for sure. Mm-hmm. And he's gonna- I'm going to wait for that album called Dragon. Ooh, that'd be good. That's going to be his like biggest. His, that's going to be his 20th album is called Dragon. Oh, fuck. He I, also has a book out. Wait, if we, anyone's we can cuss on this, right? Oh, of course. Okay, yeah. good. good. Um, I hope so. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've been, I've been <laughs> us, us at the F word dropped the, uh, which was weird. In the beginning, it's called the F word, but we didn't really swear that much because we yeah. wanted to be prim and proper. And then we scrapped that <laughs> progressively. So if you went back to the first episodes that you can only find on YouTube, mm-hmm. You're just going to see like a bunch of straight lace Fox trying to pull a podcast together. <laughs> now it's just whatever. Nice. Awesome. Uh, but yeah, Frank has a book called Being Frank. So mm-hmm. it, it's the inspiring story of Frank D'Angelo. And uh, it's a national bestseller. Incorrect. And- that's what it says on there, but that's yeah, not yeah, true. Yeah, uh, figured, yeah. yeah, it's what it says, but that's not so, that's not true. Yeah, so and then uh, includes a free music CD, what do you mean? which it didn't. <laughs> but I bought it. I bought it second. I bought it off Amazon. Like I bought. I didn't. I didn't buy it brand new off Amazon. So I get the. Uh, uh, you know what? No, actually, I'm wrong. You you can get a CD, but you have to send away for it, right. and the link to get it no longer works. Oh, so, perfect. But I could have gotten a free copy of Beautiful Now, which we talked about on Frankie D's Cocksuckers. That so. was the, that was the one you guys had me listen to. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was uh, interesting. To say the least, <laughs> um, I guess the I guess we'll start it off, gentlemen. Who the f is Frank D'Angelo? <sighs> oh, um, he is a Renaissance man. Yeah, he is an auteur. He's a he is a musician, a filmmaker, of a uh, a restaurateur, yeah. a a beer baron, a, pa- a patriot. Um, <laughs> yeah. On both sides of the border, he, like, I, I, like where where does one begin? What a hard question! Yeah, yeah. I wanted I mean, to pose the most, the broadest question on earth just to make it just mm-hmm. what the fuck? Where yeah. do we start? Well, I feel like the, because that's I feel the thing. Like this, you, some uh, some people like so for other artists or whatever or other other celebrities, you can just say who are they, and you can start off with something. Yeah. This guy, it doesn't seem like you can start with anything because there's so much. Mm-hmm. Like it's just a bunch of moving mm-hmm. targets that you're trying to like pinpoint who he act exactly he is. I have which so makes many him super notes. interesting. I have so <laughs> many notes on this fucking guy. Like just and they're just all over the place. Like hey there's man, just whoosh. the show is an all over the place type of show. That's okay, fair. so yeah. I mean you can just start wherever. <laughs> well, I you, feel like you could glibly state that he's a jack of all trades and master of none, but I I don't think yeah. that that's fair. 
Okay. Yeah, you could also glibly state that he's a jackass. Okay. So, so I wouldn't say that, but <laughs> others could. Why isn't it fair to call him a jack of all trades and a master of none? Because it seems very. Because uh, I I think that he masters it and he moves on, right. or he just adds it to the arsenal. I think that okay. I don't think uh, if you've tried any of his one minute recipes, you would say that it's a. <laughs> That he needs to get any yeah. better in the kitchen. It's Wait, true. he's got one minute recipes. Yeah, he includes one in uh, in one of his movies, uh, Sicilian Vampire, I believe it is, where he teaches you how to make a good bruschetta. <laughs> Dear lord, mm-hmm. did yeah. he get did he get that from Coppola when he decided to add that meat sauce recipe in Godfather One, just in case oh, the movie bombed? I mean, yeah, definitely. That's what that's a reference to. I didn't know that was a thing, but yeah, you're, now that I hear you say it, that's absolutely what he was making reference to. Although wow. he, the Godfather's not I don't his know favorite. What it movie. was because he he just made a bunch of commercials where he does one minute recipes as well, where he goes like. Oh, you can use my product, these little tiny onions that have an Italian name I can't remember. And uh. you can make a, th- a nice meal with salmon. And it's like, well, come on, salmon's the hard ingredient there, Frank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Boil pasta, serve pasta. One minute recipe. There you go, Cut buddy. Up the little onions. Yeah. <laughs> and then the fish. Serve your fish. Whatever. <laughs> Do whatever you want with that. I don't give a shit. It's not D'Angelo brand fish. I don't care what it is. So, um, where like I guess like how did we how did we discover Frank D'Angelo? We first discovered Frank D'Angelo when he was uh, I feel like the first time we saw it would have been his kind of low budget commercial yeah. for like this is going to be the thing where you said most people don't know him they might know this product true he was the creator and the spokesperson for a, an energy drink a Canadian energy drink called Cheetah Power Surge still is what Cheetah, pa- Cheetah Power Surge is still around like, I'm wearing a hat right now I don't know that's, it that's, is. That's, it's available in Ontario only. I'm, I'm Googling that. Okay. Cheetah. I mean, if you could find me a place where it exists, like so his website in, still in exists. Ontario. And we so we saw a commercial that uh, that featured Frank in a in a windbreaker, a Cheetah Power Surge windbreaker <laughs> that I'd love sitting to on like a stool, like a bar stool, kind of slumped over, being like, "So I just got out of a board meeting, uh, and they tell me that they don't want me to do the commercials anymore. So <laughs> we're gonna do a contest, and uh, you're gonna try to make a commercial for Cheetah Power Surge, and if you win, you could win a bunch of money. And that commercial still exists on a web. I think maybe it's gone now, but like the website for Cheetah Power Surge, I think still exists. Mm-hmm. Has a few videos, mm-hmm. um, wow. including a video where they're like giving blankets to homeless people that just stops loading ninety seconds in. It's like a <laughs> quick time video that the whole thing doesn't work, but you get the gist of it. It's a good gesture. They give mm. them a blanket. They give them a Cheetah Power Surge, probably. Oh, they give them fucking <laughs> stomach rot. Like God, Getting them all jacked up. <laughs> um, most people though would know would probably remember. The com- another commercial that Frank did for Cheetah Power Surge that featured uh, famous athlete Ben right. Johnson. Get so, out. Yeah, so it's... It, <laughs> oh, man. So in this it commercial... It was the backbone of the, the product and its oh, initial yeah. advertising campaign. It was I, the whole reason it's called Cheetah Power Surge. Yeah, uh, I've, I've been doing a ton of research on Frank, obviously, for the show. Sure. And almost every article I've read about him mentions this commercial at some point mm-hmm. in it. It's this him was and, viral. Yeah, it's him and Ben Johnson on the... on, on a, At this time, it wasn't a real show, but on the set of the Being Frank show, which would then become his actual talk show. It's a fake talk show at this point. And they're sitting there talking... And Frank goes, uh, "I Ben, when you run, do you do you cheetah?" And <laughs> and Ben Johnson goes, "Yeah, of course, I cheetah all the time." And then he holds up a cheetah energy drink. Oh God! And you know what? That's not a terrible commercial. I kind of <laughs> like that, Frank. I admire your like your guts to just do that. I go, that's funny. He approached Ben Johnson. He was like, "Yeah, I'll do it. Whatever, money's money." Like the whole thing, I go. That's not terrible advertising. <laughs> Which is a phrase that will come up with a lot of the people that Frank seems to proposition. <laughs> yes, where pretty much go, you all. Know what I'll do it. Just for I don't the know money. what it'll do to my legacy, but I'll do it because money is money. <laughs> What's funny is I just found an article uh, from Bevwire.wordpress from 2013. It's called "The Fall of Cheetah Power Surge." Oh shit! There you go. Yeah. Well, I'm we, hoping it's like a positive article being like, in the fall of 2013, the sales of Cheetah Power Surge were through the roof. <laughs> no, uh, it says something. Feature pricing have dropped as low as 25 cents a can. Oh, uh, nah, dis- Discount level indicates that the regular Frank. retail was $1.49. I don't trust Deb Wire. I yeah, mean, I, the, I, I never heard of the words they asked for slamming Frank are well documented. Yeah, I don't buy this. this bullshit. <laughs> But I mean, Fake it, news. It, 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 <laughs> what the Power Surge hat is like on par with a Make America Great hat. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the Frank D'Angelo version to be sporting your blue Cheetah Power oh, Surge. Oh boy! I mean, do we need to get into that right now? His love of his hatred of Donald Trump. We can no, save that we'll for the end. Yeah, we'll he get becomes, to that. That's a he major hates Donald Trump. Life we'll get to recently. it. We'll get to he's it. a he's like one of those Twitter anti-Trumpers yeah. who every time Donald Trump tweets, they try to get a response that like 
gets them more followers. So Mm -hmm. like every tweet, they'll just be like, you're a liar, shithead, whatever, like some sort of biting remark and trying to build their Twitter brand off of being the first and most retweeted responder. Gotcha. That's a huge part of his life now. And I don't think it's working for him. (laughs) Well, there's every now and then he gets, uh, he, he, he lands a big one. Yeah. Every now and again, Michael Parra is on it on Twitter at the same time and goes, I'm going to like that one too. And he's just at Frank D'Angelo. Uh, Frank D'Angelo, 23, I think. Of course. I think so. There might be periods in between the two. I, I don't remember. He's there blocked, he's blocked oh, us man. on Twitter, so we can't follow him. <laughs> yeah, I always have to open up a private browser when yeah. I want to take a peek at what's going on. <laughs> or you just Thank make God it. I did, and I saw the last big save was out, though. Oh, Christ. Like, buried yeah. in his tweets and only had, like, two likes. See, and I've I've messaged him directly, asking him for information about when we're going to get distribution, and just he's never responded. He's read my messages. He doesn't respond to them, and it's infuriating, Frank. Like, well, that's please. why I said you had to watch it as soon as you could because you don't yeah. know when he's going to pull it. But back to the oh, cheetah commercial. So yes, I just want to say that I feel uh, if memory Twitter. serves. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. The country was a little split on how they felt about that. Like it was a pretty – people knew about the ad campaign. They maybe didn't see the commercial itself, but word got out that disgraced Canadian Olympian Ben Johnson was going to cash in on his you know, sort of national indignity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And like I, even in t- in this in the being in being frank, the book he he talks about it, and he says that he hates that people use the term disgraced when it comes to Ben Johnson. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that he's just you know he's just he's an athlete. He won a gold medal and he set a record, and that's what he did. And like and that's his justification of it is like he he broke a record. <laughs> and there's and he nothing won. more to this story. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know where it is here, but uh, like how can you Frank that runs contrary to why that campaign would even make sense why would you hire ben johnson ask him if he's a cheetah and have him say yeah i'm a cheetah and show your like the whole thing is contingent on him being a disgraced olympian so why would you be like i hate when people say that and it wasn't this brilliant plan of his to try to expose ben johnson by secretly trying to be his friend and using cheetah as a way well, I think Ben Johnson was exposed, though, wasn't he? Already? By then? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was oh, yeah. already dis- I, I, yeah, he was disgraced, oh, yeah. in quotes. Because oh, it, that that was back in the 80s, I think, when it happened oh. at the South Korean Olympics. So gotcha. who even remembers that fucking Olympics? <laughs> Nagano, that's where my Olympic memories start. He was a, he was already exposed, but I don't think he was like kind of vindicated the way that he was with that like thirty for thirty that came out oh, yeah. twenty years after the fact or whatever. That was yeah. just like oh yeah, basically everyone was on steroids. Of He's just they the one were. that got caught. Yeah, and that's what Frank says in the book too. Is like he didn't he did wasn't it wasn't bad that he was cheating. It was bad that he got caught cheating. That's what he says. So excellent. <laughs> Which, that's a terrific that the, read on the situation. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So <laughs> that's, that's what I'll put in statement, print. right? That, oh, yeah. That's a statement of all statements. It's, it's bold for sure. So then, this cheetah power surge isn't around anymore, right? No, no, it's still around. It's it's, it's available. Kicking. All of all uh, D'Angelo brand merchandise, uh, with the exception of a few things, are only available in Ontario. Only in Ontario. It's, it's okay. not available in as many places as the commercial that still streams on his uh, talk show <laughs> yeah. tells you like on the bottom, yeah. there's like a Chiron of all the places mm-hmm. like the CNN sort of stream that lists all kinds of establishments that absolutely do not carry the product anymore. I think it's only at Sobeys. I think Sobeys might be the only, and like through their own distribution. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, the other, but the big, the big feather in Frank's cap in terms of like, uh, you know, D'Angelo brands is they are, they are the exclusive distributor and manufacturer of Arizona iced tea. Get out. Yeah. So they, like in Canada, in Canada. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like anytime you have an Arizona iced tea, you are supporting Frank D'Angelo. So go out wow. there and drink as much of that Arizona iced tea as you can. See, what's interesting is that now I feel that this Tommy Wiseau comparison is totally wrong because nobody knows what his nationality is. Nobody knows where his money comes from. Mm-hmm. No one knows anything about him. He well, that's out, true about Frank too. No one knows it? where his money comes from. He just has it. Well, I mean, there's some question. There's I mean, some- it starts to get murky. Like the yeah. Arizona fortune doesn't, it doesn't hold right. for some of the other numbers that get tossed out later in his life. Once he starts pursuing other avenues, the amount of money, like his film budgets, well, his reported budgets. Yeah, but that's that's a clear, like we know where that comes from. Barry Sherman finances all of his stuff. No, that's true. That's a fact. Like I've looked, okay. that's a fact. Right. I have that down here. Barry Sherman financed all of that stuff. Barry Sherman. I mean, it makes sense. And we'll get to Barry Sherman. Barry Sherman is a, a Canadian pharmaceutical billionaire 
who he's he was actually murdered in 2017. But we'll get to that. Oh shit. We'll get to that. Uh, he started a company called Apotex, which makes uh, generic like off-brand medications. Okay. And then and is like he was worth like 11 billion dollars at some point or something like that. Like shit. fucking crazy money. And him and Frank became friends in 2002. Okay. And uh, and again we'll get to all this once we get you know as the story progresses. But uh, they became friends and then Barry Sherman basically just financed like pretty much everything that Frank has done since then. And why him? Was there any reason? Like why become, Frank? Yeah. They just liked each other. Wow. He just, he, Barry Sherman has a, he had a, a reputation for, um, and this is, these are in articles. So Frank, if you're listening to this, this isn't me <laughs> saying this, this is what other people have said about you and, and about Barry Sherman, but about Barry Sherman, people say that he had a tendency to kind of like just trust in people despite uh, just glaring red flags, and he just he always saw the best in people, even when that might not have actually existed. And so he just kept a lot of people in his inner circle that were questionable and had questionable business well, tactics uh, and all that kind of stuff. And Frank it got, gets lumped into that grouping. I'm not saying that's <laughs> okay. Frank, but he yeah, gets lumped he, into I that definition. I don't think Frank necessarily is one of those people. You got to keep in mind that at this point in, of his life, Frank was just like a promoter, a business guy. He had a brand. Yeah, he was selling Apple He juice. had products. Yeah. yeah, exactly. He was He was all about kind of, you know, the hustle, and I'm sure that this guy respected that. For sure. Uh, they, they met when Frank was trying to buy a factory that Barry owned that also had a... Um, a brewery next to it that, that was also a part of the deal. And so Frank was trying to buy this factory to create apple juice mm -hmm. or expand his apple juice production. And then they, they ended up buying it. They were going to sell off the brewery, but then realized it would actually be make more sense to start brewing beer as well. And so they started Steelback Beer, and then that's a whole other thing. So, um, so yeah, so that's how their working relationship began. And then they just kind of became in, really in good friends. In Frank's defense, that seems like how rich people make friends with each other. Yeah, well, like yeah. shooting the shit while buying factories. Yeah, <laughs> go, yeah, that, that makes sense at the upper echelon. You're networks. buying a factory. Like, I'm buying a factory. I'm Are we friends factory. now? Yeah. Like, <laughs> do we just become best yeah. friends? Frank? You want to do karate in the garage? <laughs> yep, I got a big factory we can do karate That's in. Right. Yeah, Hoist Gracie's gonna be there. <laughs> We're rich. We don't give a fuck. Um. Uh, so I, I read I read this book this morning. I read the Being Frank book. Garrett and I had already read about fifty pages of it. I went back to the start, read the whole goddamn thing, and uh, and uh, it's one hundred and fifty some pages. You can read it in about two hours. It's a quick yeah. it's a quick breeze. But I do have some interesting notes that I've taken from Please. it. Um, I, want, I, I, I think you should maybe sum up his business because that was what he was all about. He was a business yeah. guy for a while, and then we can touch on his early years because that's where his heart lied in being an entertainer, and that's True. kind of his second chapter. His first chapter was he abandoned the love of his youth, which yeah. was performing, which was music, which was being just an all-out entertainer. That's what that was what he felt was kind of his calling, but also he abandoned it because he was like, I can't make money doing this, so I'm out. <laughs> um but then he he made his fortune as a businessman, and then he was able to use that as a stepping stone yeah. into all of his long held dreams. Mm -hmm. But I don't know as much about his business years as you do. Like that's what the book is about. It's a, it's like a real well, Jim Tra Living sort of thing. Yeah, it's more so of the early years then. Yeah, it, this book was published in like this book was published before. Uh, um, uh, fucking beautiful now and when's the time came out okay so he'd already released a couple albums and he was gearing up to release the next two albums so he okay. talks about at the end of the book how he's so excited for the next two albums and Garrett he talks about a, a dream that he has for like what he wants to do with his music career that I can't like wait to tell dream. you about I, no no like a, a what he, a, an aspirated daydream <laughs> but I can't wait I to it. tell you about it so um, we're teasing a lot of Does stuff the, at the start of this sure, episode yeah, so, man, it's, and I got one just question in. as well yeah. Does the book include his attempt to become a CFL team owner? He oh. briefly mentions it, but doesn't get too deep into like what happened with other than it didn't really work and that people called it a publicity stunt. So <laughs> that, that checks. Unfair. Unfair reading. Exactly. Oh, it, yeah. it is unfair. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely unfair. He, if anybody could have brought back the Ottawa Renegades or the Ottawa Rough Riders or uh, what he wanted to call backs. them. Yeah, the Ottawa Steelbacks is what he wanted to call them. It would have been Frank and, and well, it would have been Barry Sherman's money and Frank's a business sense. So I they should have like just gone name, straight though. for the Vancouver Grizzlies. Mm, that would have been good too. Back. But yeah, I, I'm with you, Garrett. I don't hate the name the Ottawa Steelbacks. I think it's a, it's, it's like, it's not a terrible name for a football team. It's also not a terrible mm -hmm. name for anything. Like as a beer, that's a good name. So Steelbacks, yeah. 
And the story of how he came up with that name is great. He was, uh, he, he, they were working on the factory, getting the factory cleaned up in ship shape to produce this beer. And he was driving, he drove past a field where there was a, a, well, he says, a father and two sons working in the field. There's no way he could have known that. But he drove past a field <laughs> with three people in it. And they were all out there with their shirts off, working in the hot sun, doing their thing. And that was at the start of the day. When he came home at the end of the day, they were still out there working. And he was like, man, those guys, they got, a, they got backs of steel. And then he went... Oh, that's it's, we're going to call it steel back. And the, and the other oh. people in the car went, that's a great idea, actually. That's we can market that, blah, blah, blah. And that's where the idea came from. So, not terrible. Not Literally terrible. making money off of their their steel backs. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, so Frank got his start uh, delivering newspapers at okay. the age of, I believe, nine. Uh, I don't have notes on this stuff, so I'm just going to have to go by memory for this early, early stuff. Sure. It doesn't matter. Yeah, he yeah, got like the, we don't have to go too specific, just so more like... Yeah. Where he's, he, was, he was selling newspapers, uh, delivering newspapers for the Toronto Telegraph, I believe, mm-hmm. and then very early on, he started uh, like hiring um, like kids in the neighborhood to deliver his newspapers for him, and he would give them like a cut of what he got. So he started very quickly outsourcing his work to other people, and, and it got into a managerial position mm-hmm. as like a nine-year-old. That ended, and then it uh, his music, uh, he started doing music, and then that ended, and then he started uh, He started an apple juice company. He started, uh, he took over his dad's, his dad was already doing, I believe, apple juice uh, sales, and uh, Frank took it over, renamed it D'Angelo Brands, and then got into the apple juice business like hardcore, and that's where like yeah. he really got his foot in the door of business was selling this apple juice. He initially sold it door to door out of the back of his truck. Oh, damn. Which, like, hey, if you're going to buy apple juice, why not buy it from a guy driving up to your house with just a jug of yeah. apple juice? That's been in the exactly. back of his truck in the hot sun yeah, all day. That seems trustworthy. From someone with no reputation. <laughs> For sure, yeah. Of a brand you've never heard of before. <laughs> yeah. Here it is, a jug of pissed colored liquid. Drink it. It's apple juice. I swear. It's great. Have a sniff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if memory serves, yeah. uh, Frank's father, who ran the business, thought – Pretty small. He he yeah. didn't want to get he didn't want to go big with it, and that was just kind of a source of friction because Frank wanted to go all in you know, on apple juice. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. he was a, he was a mogul. He had mogul dreams, and so um so he <laughs> he was a real Gatsby. Yeah. <laughs> So he started, yeah, expanding his operation. Uh, that's when Barry Sherman comes into the picture. He bought this new thing. There's really like, he, there, he goes into a lot of the nuances of how to make apple juice, which is like very bizarre in the book. Like, to, and gives talk, away the secret recipe. Well, not not are, so much are that. apples involved? Uh, b- minimally. Oh, like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> the hint of apple is in the air, but. <laughs> But like, like, yeah, the factory he bought, they like, they could also make like pig feed. <laughs> like, it was just this sweet, bizarre amalgamation of things. And uh, and then yeah, once he once he uh, once he got hooked up with Barry Sherman and they started Steelback Brewery, he kind of like uh, put D'Angelo Brands on the back burner and focused all of his energy on on brewing beer and and, and promoting beer. Essentially, mm-hmm. not not so much the brewing, but the promoting of it. And that's where like he really started to make some business mistakes. So <laughs> and and did that sort of co align with the. Uh, the explosion of the twins commercial from like those Budweiser campaigns. Where it's like, and twins. And oh, Frank was like, I want in on that world. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to the Bud Light party, the Bud Light summer party or whatever it's called. <laughs> I want to meet yeah, that, that talking was frog. was a big part of it. The, like the shift in tone of beer commercials where it became all about partying in like yeah. the late nineties, early two mm. thousands. In fact, <laughs> that was like, the, that's, that's my world. The was up era. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The Scary Movie 1 era. Scary yeah. Movie 1 was up uh, era of, uh, man, some of those do not age well at all. Unless uh, most you, of them. Unless yeah. you were there, yeah. make no sense whatsoever. I mean, we have a show called Dane Cox Cook unless Suckers. Unless you were Keenan Ivory oh, yeah. Where we talk about Dane Cook and you want to talk about things that haven't aged well. Yeah. That, that man's comedy has not aged great. But hey, check check out our Patreon and you can find uh, yeah. the official Goatsy Podcast Patreon. You, you can, can find waste all our real Suckers. money real fast. You spend 15 <laughs> real bucks American dollars that you won't get back because we can't even access it. It just sits there waiting, I don't have a growing. <laughs> just, just, just one day. Yeah, for that for that one day. One day we're gonna cash in to pay our legal fees when Frank D'Angelo sues us. Yeah. So, so yeah. and because he sued, what you said twice? No, uh, just one guy. He's he's threatened litigation. He talk. He loves threatening litigation. This book is filled with stories of him threatening to sue people. So any disclaimers <laughs> we put out on this episode is because he may listen to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or their uh, their uh, podcast that is specifically about Frank. Yeah. And he may just decide to sue. But yep. 
Seems and like, like he just likes the threat part podcast, of it. Though. What's that story? He just likes the threat part of it. I, yeah, from the sounds of it, he, he he retracted the one that he was he was trying to sue a blogger for two million dollars because of some things that he said in his blog, mm-hmm. and uh, he retracted that after an apology, and uh, he wrote an ap- apology blog. So I think all we have to do is make an apology podcast, and we should be okay. So we'll see. Um, I also wouldn't be surprised if after this podcast is like after it comes out, uh, if like if I'm, like uh, I think it's a Godfather three, if a Godfather three montage starts where we're all just like murdered. Murdered one by one, just by mysterious people. We're all just killed. Well, that's like, the first Godfather. Oh, it's the first Godfather. The first oh, sorry. Yep, okay, yep, okay, yep, yeah, yep. yeah. Um, uh, I'm more of a deer hunter man myself. Uh, oh. But uh, but yeah, he just, one by one, we all just <laughs> nice. get killed. So right, right. <laughs> that's a reference to real gangsters. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what else? So, what was questionable about his uh, about his business dealings after the steal back thing that you mentioned? He he started making some bad like investment decisions. That's and, the one. Yeah, yeah, and and like. <sighs> From what I've gleaned from the articles I've read about him and the research I've done is that um, he he was focused more on promotion and yep. not so much on distribution. Okay. So he was all about building the brand but not spreading the brand out. Mm-hmm. Uh, at one point, and this is kind of the thing from the sounds of it that might have sunk the company, uh, He they sponsored, they became the title sponsor for the Toronto Grand Prix in 2007. They took over, Molson dropped it in 2006, uh, Steelback Brewery took over in 2007. They renamed it the Steelback Grand Prix. They signed a multi-year deal with um, with uh, the Grand Prix that they were going to do. They were going to sponsor many Grand Prix. After the first year, uh, they did the, the Grand Prix happened. A few months later, they had to file for credit protection, and then uh, the the Grand Prix. Uh, uh, closed. They shut down, and then they they 2008 did not have a Toronto Grand Prix, and then the company that was running the Grand Prix merged with a different company, and now they're doing Grand Prix again. Oh. so Steelback Brewery like kind of fucked the Grand Prix over a little bit, <laughs> uh, a little bit. Know. We don't know about that. Well, we don't it, know. It, about it could have been bad timing. Credit for here it could be bad timing. Yeah, yeah. It could have been just his the, ability to land some of these big deals because yeah. I think at the same time he became a, an official provider for one of the CFL teams maybe the argonauts or something like that it was but the like, argonauts yeah steelback beer was was a big part of the cfl experience in toronto mm-hmm. and he also him and his band the steelback two to fours they would sing the national anthem at a lot of argonauts games he did the coin toss at a few games and uh so yeah they, do you very think that was a condition built into yes the whole deal like <laughs> yeah, yeah. they not, sat down to be question. like all right how is steelback going to be involved yeah he went, well, I'm going to tell you how I'm going to be involved. I'm going to be doing some national anthems. I'm going to be doing some half times. Yeah. I'm going to be doing some coin flips. I'm going to be playing some quarterback. And they went, all right, you're going to make it Frank. And he goes, hey, that's how you negotiate. You that's throw right. it out there. So uh, my question is, no, not my question. I did read that he did get booed. Oh, yeah. And yeah, that, yeah. was that every time he did <laughs> no, the national no, that was, You should know what song got him booed. Sure, yeah. What song was it that got him booed, Garrett? That would be the classic song, Oh Canada, the <laughs> national anthem. <laughs> yep. Ended and received a resounding chorus of boos. There are several articles that detail the experience of people hating. Like, there's summaries of football games, and there'll be lines like, the only thing worse than the performance of the Lions before halftime was the halftime performance itself by self-proclaimed music superstar Frank the Ant. Like, just <laughs> biting shit from people who... Should stay in their fucking lanes if you ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, better, yeah. you, you guys write about sports. You wouldn't know good music if it bit you in the ass, you, apparently. Yeah, you but. wouldn't know a good fuck from a bad fuck. How does that sound? <laughs> Cowards out there. What I find, what I'm finding interesting, especially with the, the two hours that we had before this one, <laughs> is that you both love and just like you don't, you can't find the proper words to talk about this guy. Because mm-hmm. on the one hand, you'll defend them. You'll defend him to no end. There's certain things I won't defend him I on. I wouldn't want him to go away. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's he scratches an itch that I didn't know I had until it got scratched, and I went, "Oh, wait, I right. love this. Actually, this is this is my wheelhouse. I love mm. this kind of stuff." In all, and he's just he's so fascinating of a person. I want right. to understand him. I I want to know. I want to sit down and talk to him. I want to. And when we eventually have our litigation, we will <laughs> I get would to make so. It before. Well, I but would, one thing we didn't know is like we saw those commercials for D'Angelo, uh, D'Angelo being like, oh, I can't do the commercials anymore <laughs> for Cheetah Power Surge. And then like 15 years went by. Yeah. No, maybe not that. No, many. that's too long. That was like 2009. So like 10 years, eight years went by, yeah. 10 years went by. And then we rediscovered him like we yeah. all his whole life happened. Oh. And then we kind of came back to him. Mm hmm. 
Was that you and or was that just him going underground and then reemerging? Oh, no, that, that was us. Garrett, yeah, Garrett it stumbled across him again and came across his life. I can't even life. remember how he got reintroduced into my world. Oh, but yeah, beautiful. somehow it came up that like, I think it was the Being Frank talk show mm. somehow came across my my lens. Because that even predates his movies, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, That's about where the book ends is yeah. where he starts kickstarting the – but he's got restaurants to do before that. He's getting mm-hmm. so right now he's he's singing our beautiful national anthem. Yeah. With all our son's command, <laughs> the way that he still sings it, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, none of that French shit either. English only. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, he's Italian. So he's I mean, you can't food, expect him to do it French. Well, it. he's not Italian. He's Canadian. His parents are oh, right. Sicilian. Oh, okay. So, yeah, yeah. but yes, he's, you know, he's got, he's, Is yeah. that why he has an affinity for gangsters? Yeah. Of the Sicilian background. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. But like yeah, specifically yeah. Sicilian, like if he was from Florence, it wouldn't really matter that Like much. he is definitely the kind of person It'd that would say that, that Sicilians are different than Italians. Right. He would definitely say that those are distinct groups of people in Italy. I don't know what one or the other. I don't know much about Italians. So. Okay, that's fair. Other than they talk with their hands. They do. That's all I know about I was there them. for three weeks. Oh, nice. It's really nice. Mm. But they do talk with their hands. Did you meet any D'Angelo's while you were there? No. Ah, that's damn. No. Well, you weren't in Sicily, so. Was anyone yeah, drinking was... a cheetah power surge while you were there? Or a pure genius water? Or... No Did and they give no. one to you like a lay when you get to Hawaii? They hand you a cheetah power <laughs> surge and you get off the plane? I, I should also like to say that uh, we watched the commercials for, Frank, for cheetah power surge. And then I immediately started drinking Cheetah Power Surge exclusively. <laughs> like oh, I, wow. I stopped. Yeah, I, I drank a lot. Of, I smoked a lot of weed. I drank yeah. a lot of energy drinks to get me through the day. I would. I went. Okay, fuck it. I'm just going to drink Cheetah Power Surge then. Because, and uh, they they mm, they were certainly distinct when it came to uh, uh, energy drinks. And they were uh, caffeine free, and that's no bull. Yeah, and they had a lot of taurine in them, which uh, I don't know what that does the to fuck you. Is but I don't know, but it's a it's an it's a it's a natural ingredient. They have ginkgo biloba in them and all that kind of stuff. Sure, they're, they're very healthy. There is a commercial that still runs on his talk show for Cheetah Power Surge, where the voiceover it's like it's like showing a Chinese market, <laughs> and there's like someone riding a little like it's just silhouettes of people in this Asian market, and there's this person kind of riding a bicycle, and the voiceover goes with secrets. From from the Orient, <laughs> cheetah parents. <laughs> <laughs> and he still opts to use that as like, yeah, that's fine. I mean, it could have been worse. Like, at least he didn't make it racist. Like, he could have been like, <laughs> oh, with secrets of the order. That's true. Like, oh, he like really made it much down more down on the yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. unlike when he does his Barack Obama. <laughs> Ugh, which is a pretty good Barack Obama. <laughs> no, it is not. It's not bad. It's Why it, would he need to do a Barack Obama? Oh, for the opening of the movie No Deposit, where he talks about the housing He's crisis. He's got a lot of thoughts about big business and corporation, and right. he finds mm-hmm. that uh, a, a presidential speech is a good one. Way to get that across, but really God, we're still all over the, the map home. here. Yeah, we we got to rain. We're going to sound like frantic, crazy people. People are listening to this being like, they're like fucking flat earthers talking about this idiot. And we've never talked about it like this before. We, every time we talked about Frank, it's no. very pointed and direct. We have a, we have a focus for our episode. It's a mm-hmm. movie. You or talk it's a, like people yeah. know everything we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't, too bad. Yeah, Keep fuck up. you. Well, you guys, welcome to the F word because that's how we do things here. <laughs> Perfect. You just We just press play and we fucking go. Yeah. That's, how, that's how that works. Excellent. Well, then we'll so, fit right in. So he gets into the Argos. He does his stuff. Is mm. this what kickstarts the music career? Uh, the, like the national like anthem was bit. maybe the catalyst to be like, "Hey, I'm doing this in front of people. I can just keep going." He's he, yeah. I bet you it's he thought he could meld those worlds a little bit. The light bulb probably went off at some point where he's like, "You know what? I can somehow utilize this to bring up these dormant passions of mine." But he still had a leaning towards business, mm-hmm. and, and like. Oh shit! No, never mind. I had so I had lost it. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah, I had a. I had someone was going to say, and it slipped away. I hope you don't feel out of sorts. No, no, I'm good. I'm We're good. in your studio. <laughs> I know. I'm very comfortable. My shoes are off. My feet are on the desk. I'm very Excellent. comfortable. Excellent. Crocs on the floor. So then, okay. You had a research. You he came back into your lens. Somehow he never left exactly yours. How. No, no, he uh, he was gone from mine entirely. He was gone from yeah. yours. I, I and drank Cheetah Power Surge. Yep. and then in two thousand and like. Uh, 13 or 14, mm-hmm. I had heart palpitations, oh, so I had geez. to stop drinking energy drinks entirely. It's it's not because of the cheater power surge, but it was because of energy <laughs> drinks in general. Just Probably energy drinks. Ones. The taurine exactly. wasn't, no the taurine didn't do anything? No, no. It, no it, 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 I don't know what it did, but I can I can say on record, Frank, that it wasn't the cheetah power surge that gave me heart palpitations, and you can take that to the bank. You too, Ben Johnson. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and then Garrett, when, what was it that brought him back into your lens again? I can't really remember. I wish I knew exactly what it was that somehow 
brought him back in. Oh, like I said, I think it was the Being Frank show. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Which, and what is the Being Frank show? So the Being Frank show is a talk show that Frank does. Um, I mean, you'll notice that it, he's really stuck with this being Frank thing. It was yes. the fictional show of his commercial campaign. It was the name of his book. He really loves that double entendre. Mm -hmm. um, and so the being Frank show is his kind of like late night talk show, somewhat modeled after the tonight show. Mm, open um, mic with Mike Bullard. Yeah, definitely got a lot of that flavor to it. It's more of that flavor. Um, but it's very low budget. It's shot in the basement. So I guess we should probably briefly oh God, touch on his restaurants. So much. Because that, that seemed to be the next endeavor. And then from owning <laughs> the restaurants, it allowed him to be like, well, if I'm going to build a restaurant, I'm going to build – like any good restaurateur, mm -hmm. I'm going to include a television studio in the basement <laughs> where I can put together my <laughs> weekly talk show. Uh, OK. Well, we need, I need to talk about a few things first before we get into that then because there's a few things we're missing here. Um so in 2007, after the Grand Prix, uh, Steelback and D'Angelo Brands filed for protection from creditors. Oh, right. At that time, Barry Sherman, the main investor of those two businesses, was owed somewhere between 100 and $120 million. By whom? Frank? People Frank owed him that. Maybe like, not Frank. I don't want to say that. Or like, all the nice not, guys. Not, I don't want to say Frank. I don't want to say Frank. Yeah. But it, he was owed that money from from the brands. Right. From Steelback Breweries. Wash. From no, that's a fact. That's a fact. D'Angelo Brands and Steelback, they owed Barry Sherman $120 million. Jeez. They were in his pocket for that. So then in November 2007, Frank sold his majority stake in Steelback to John Sherman, who was the son of Barry. Okay. Uh, but D'Angelo remained as the chairman with a minority interest in uh, in the company. In 2008, I'm just going to give you the – this is, yeah, this yeah, is yeah, the history yeah. of Steelback. You go. In 2008, Steelback relaunched under the, the um, under um, uh, uh, John Sherman. And then in 2009, they won a whole bunch of brewing awards. Like their their beer became like uh, crit, like a critical hit after that. Mm -hmm. In this – in the Being Frank book, Frank does claim that they won – before that, they won a lot of blind taste testing competitions. Of course. And that people <laughs> – <laughs> people loved the beer before John took it over, but it they did not award winning the way it became after John took it over. Yeah, and then in 2010, uh, Steelback Brewery quietly shut down forever. <laughs> quietly, they just shut down quietly. Over. That's it. We're closing the doors. <laughs> Forget this ever happened. I'm so sorry we did this. And does he mention any of that in the book at all? Does anybody know what what the quietly part was? No, that happened after the book was written. Oh shit! Yeah, so I think this book came out in 2000. Eight or something like that. In 2008. Oh no, 2011. So, but he must have written it like in 2009 Ooh, or shit. 10 or something like that. So, that's so funny. Yeah, and it's funny because it's just quietly shut the yeah. doors. Yeah, like, that's it. Oh, sorry, forget about that. That beer company. They we're done here. Yeah. Their their big selling feature before John Sherman took it over was that they sold their beer in 16 ounce cans, the standard size for Arizona iced tea. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Now, now that I've said that, I have to read off this list of things here. Please. This. <laughs> Frank D'Angelo makes a lot of claims in, the, in being Frank the book. And here are some of the claims. Uh, he invented many things. <laughs> All right. Here are just a list of the things that Frank D'Angelo has invented. Wait, and you said he doesn't like Trump. Doesn't like Trump. Hates Trump. Oh, man, that's such a Trump thing to say. I know, right? <laughs> uh, well, he, he didn't say it like well, that. Well, let's hold, let's reserve judgment. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm willing to believe that these are D'Angelo inventions. Mm -hmm. Okay. He invented putting canola oil in three-liter jugs, which is the standard for canola oil now. His dad's business sold canola oil back in the 80s and 90s. Frank said, hey, Dad, you should put those in three-liter jugs. And his dad said, okay. The competition laughed at him. Now everybody's doing it. That was Frank's idea. Uh -huh. Put it in three-liter jugs. Now it's the standard. He also invented – Well, hold on. Okay. Do you have any proof to the contrary? Uh, nope, I don't. That's why I'm saying right. it. I'm not saying he didn't oh, okay. do this. I'm saying these facts for you. Yeah. Fair I enough. might be saying it with a bit of a, a lilt in my voice, but I'm enjoying mm -hmm. myself. This is a fun experience. So, All right. uh, he invented putting canola oil in three liter jugs. He invented vitamin water. He invented flavored I water. 50 Cent invited, invented vitamin water. <laughs> no, Frank D'Angelo did. He beat him to the punch. <laughs> that's, a bold guy, that's a bold guy to take on. I like it. I know. But, you <laughs> you know. got shot to the face, man. You can't fuck around there. Yeah, I wonder if Frank's been shot. I doubt it. I feel like he would have mentioned that. Yeah. That would have been the linchpin of his story, actually. It, it would have been the title. Yeah. I got shot. <laughs> I took I took <laughs> shot for what I believe in. Yeah. <laughs> that'd be a, that'd be an album called that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, It'd yeah. be called Bang Bang. <laughs> that'd be I would listen to that. I might listen to everything Frank makes, but uh, so he invented vitamin water. Okay. He invented yeah. flavor flavored water. Of course. He was the first one yeah. to think of selling flavored water according to this book. Okay. Uh, he invented beer in plastic bottles. 
Okay. That, that was his idea. <laughs> he invented lime beer. So like putting yeah, uh, yeah, beer, yeah. In, uh, beer in limes. Uh, he brought balsamic vinegar to Canada. Nobody had, nobody had tried balsamic vinegar in Canada until Frank D'Angelo brought it here. Wow. And I think most impressively, he invented the canned Arizona iced tea. So Arizona iced tea was selling it in bottles, mm -hmm. glass bottles. Frank said, you should put that in 16-ounce cans. And they said, okay. And now that's it. That's all you can get is the 16-ounce cans. True. Yeah. So, I mean, Frank is pretty prolific when it comes to inventions. And, and these are just, these are facts taken out of his book, Being Frank, that he wrote himself. It's, an, it's a national bestseller. Any, any citations in there? Uh, no, no, there's no index. There's no <laughs> nothing like that. It's just it just ends at a certain at page one fifty four. It just ends. So. Oh, okay, <laughs> one fifty four just done. Yeah, it, it's like his songs. Yeah, yeah. They just end. You like know what? there's no definitive ending. <laughs> they just kind of trail off and stop. <laughs> I'd like to make a correction to what I said here. His <laughs> his book doesn't just end. It ends. It doesn't end on page one fifty four. Oh. It ends on page one thirteen, and then there's just four extra chapters of about stuff Frank likes. <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's a chapter 10 is called on goaltending and it's just all about hockey Ooh, and why he loves hockey. He a goalie. Uh yeah. there's one all about cheetah and like cheetah power surge. Uh <laughs> his music. It, de it deserves its own chapter. For sure. And then uh you know on reflection there's a nice little chapter all about reflecting on his life and <laughs> Is is that like his version of uh the fuck's it called? Um Revelations, Mine. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's There's like a lot of his talk own of man, many headed serpents, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> that is so fucking wild. Yeah, that it is so wild. This, the being frank, being frank, the book is, it, it, it's very much like his newest movie, The Last Big Save, which we don't have to talk about too much because you know, like it's it just came out. But it's very much like, oh shit, it's ending already. Wait, what? There's still like so much shit left <laughs> afterwards. What's all this other stuff? Oh, what the fuck is all this shit now? So, I know none of that makes sense. But go to Amazon Prime, watch the last big save. It'll all make sense to you. I think you described it as twenty percent movie and eighty percent of hockey scene. <laughs> yeah, not like to a spoil it. Game. Not to spoil it, but yeah. yes, you're yeah. mostly like just the watching worst a hockey beer game. league hockey game you can imagine, featuring uh, Anton Yelchin or whatever his name is, right. Alexi oh, uh, Yashin. Yeah. Alexi That's Yashin. Yeah. <laughs> Anton Yelchin, rest in peace. Uh, rest Raven film. Power. Sat, <laughs> it sat in the vault for a while. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the D'Angelo curse strikes again. Mm -hmm. so, okay. What is the D'Angelo curse? So, Frank, well, I just want to quickly okay, touch sure, on yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Because you talked about him inventing flavored water. He and did. That one sounds, I mean, it's a bold claim. Yeah. So I yeah. did a quick Google search of uh, flavored water invention. Right. And I found a, uh, I found a link that features like a scanned page um, <laughs> from, from a book. Called Being Frank. From, you know, it says it says here pages from a Renaissance book show that our love for expensive infused waters dates back centuries. Uh, <laughs> well, you say that, but here at the start of chapter seven, the accidental beer baron, he says, "I was the first guy to come out with vitamin water. I was the first one to have flavored water. Now everyone has flavored water." <laughs> he didn't. He, wait, wait. So he didn't lead into it. it. He always, just started saying yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, that's how the chapter starts. So. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, Garrett can say one thing, but Frank D'Angelo says another thing. <laughs> in and his book hey, I'm just that he wrote. I found, yeah. yeah. What book do I put more credence in? Yeah. Being Frank by Frank D'Angelo or some book written by some douche from like 1462? Yeah. Some dead I'm going to go with Frank. Exactly. Right. You put rose petals in your water. It's not the same as what Frank did. He mm -hmm. put a little bit of cheetah into his pure genius <laughs> waters and called it flavor water. It's brilliant. <laughs> he accidentally mixed a vat of like carbonated water inside <laughs> an old cheetah one, came out with a bit of a tropical hint to it, and he said, I invented flavor water. Uh, <laughs> me, I invent flavor water. Let's pause for a second. I yeah. gotta go to the bathroom. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah. So, does he use his own, uh, like, his songs in that in these movies? Yeah, of course. So it all blends together. It's all one thing. He, so, yeah. Is it like? <laughs> Is it like when you're watching like the MCU, you just watch all of it to get the full experience? <laughs> <laughs> like you listen to the albums, you watch some of the movies before, you hear him talk, you read his book, and really you get the full experience when you watch all of his movies and hear the rest of his yeah, albums. That's the best way to absorb Frank D'Angelo is just is to take in everything. You need to take in I'd the say whole it's even it's worse than the MCU because that's really like mainstream. Yeah. 
what we've done is the equivalent of those people that read like the Halo novels and oh, buy the version yeah. of the game that comes with like the orchestral score and everything. Like they want to know the yeah. lore of a character that they kill two minutes into the first game kind of thing. Mm-hmm, for that's, sure. that's where we've gotten to with this. Wow. Because no one else knows about this shit and there's, they're not interested well, when you try to bring it up not either. For long. And you will do it incessantly. <laughs> If yeah, I'd be, I, I'd be interested to see uh, your your numbers for this episode. To see how quickly people shut this one off. Yeah. <laughs> well, my voice alone, contrasted with your guys's, is going to make people be like, "I can't do this." This high pitched, no. like no, weaselly <laughs> guy next to these smooth baritones. Well, we have the best mics, so <laughs> yeah, that's true. And we're not on <laughs> Skype either. Uh, no, see this uh, this show has had a long history of questionable audio here and there, <laughs> from like the really nice and smooth to the like. Even when I'm listening, I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? So I wouldn't work, concern yourselves too much, right? Plus, well, I, I keep just, eating on mic, and I'm not going to stop. We, we don't hear you eating. It's all good. It, yeah, you're fine. Oh, well, then let me adjust. Yeah, yeah. Eat some more. Eat chips. Eat something yeah. crunchier, louder. Mm. Um. So he's the newest one. The newest movie that he came out with was called what? Sorry, the last big save. We're still waiting on making a deal with the devil, which will be his ninth film. Right. Tenth mm, film? Maybe tenth. Might be tenth. Ten films. Well, okay, let, let's list them. So up. he's had. He's like more Tarantino. movie. Yeah, like is he going to stop after ten or is he going to oh, keep no. going? Well, he might because the money's run out. So I don't know what right. like I don't know where what well, I don't know what the future holds for. We honestly didn't think this movie was going to come out, right? Because it was announced last year, and it just yeah the the energy in Frank's camp, so to speak, yeah, has changed over the last couple of years. Yes, there used to be a lot of production, a lot of things coming out, and then with the presidency of Donald Trump, <laughs> it's really turned into like his focus is just apparently to be on Twitter all day, mm-hmm. just tweeting these same things that have like buzzwords. Like for a while, he was really he was adding to this phrase that he was calling Donald Trump, where it started with rancid fish lips, and then it became like rancid fish lips, tiny mushroom. Referring to his penis, um, and then there was one other thing too. Like it just it kept me. building where he would just Trump would tweet something and he'd be like, "You are a liar. You cage up children. You rancid fish lip tiny mushroom. Impeach <laughs> hashtag in jail time soon. Oh, yeah, jail time was. soon. Yeah, that was it. They don't seem to connect though. It seems like he's just saying the words and n- nothing in between to connect them. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Well, they're hashtags. They're just you know. Oh, they're yeah, just, yeah, just hashtags. Anger yeah, just it's hashtags. just it's it, it's all beyond being unleashed. I mean, I've got my own theories as to what it might be, but uh, well, I, I, just, I have let's nothing hear it. to back yeah. them yeah. up. So I'm going to keep them to myself. No, no. no, 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 no what's what's, what's, what's your are, main theory? These are theories. Well, I just folks. think. Well, why would so we've we've gone okay. The similarities with Trump and mm-hmm. and and D'Angelo. There's some you can draw some parallels between sure. their their conduct, their behaviors. They own businesses with their name on it. Money talks for. Frank. Fuck and I think yeah. that he wor- he worries about how Trump influences the markets, which are probably a very volatile source of his income. <laughs> and so that's where the hate comes from. But like I say, that's all alleged. I have no idea what Frank's financial situation is. Yeah. But I think he worries about Trump's influence on that, which is why it seems so arbitrary when he goes after Frank for things where it's like, that's what you do. <laughs> that's your behavior. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it's like a projection for you to admonish him. But I think that th- at the end of the day, he's a businessman, and he doesn't like how Frank is effect- or how uh, Trump. Donald Trump might affect I mean, his bottom line. You in that whole time, you were mixing them up. You kept switching them, and it's just like they're the, I, the, the, it's the same. I, thing. Like I think, I think Here's that's. My, it, I, mean, I think they, that they should do uh, Frank D'Angelo's The Canadian Apprentice. Oh wow! Yeah, we so talked. You're, oh. you're jumping off from Shark Tank. Well, maybe or it, Den maybe it could to, start on Dragon's Den, and right. then we get a spin off. Mm-hmm. That's like a CBC production. Because everyone's going to be like, I want to work with him based yeah. on his conduct. <laughs> we love this man who Dragon's screams man. at people. And not just that, he can help you in everything. I mean, you want to get a movie done, he can help you. You want to get an album made, he can help you. Fuck if yeah. you want to get a angle. business. Start turning Dragons then into like a talent show. Like they're yeah. running out of good businesses <laughs> anyway. Right. Start having some people come in with movie pitches, theme park ideas, all oh. kinds of stuff that Frank can be like, I'm the guy who can make that happen. Oh, that well, would be great. Well, you guys have a movie that you would pitch him yeah. to contract or to counter. Oh, he should just uh, make us write all his movies. Yeah, we we would write the fuck out of Frank D'Angelo's yeah. movies, but then they'd lose mm-hmm. some of their charm. We would we would they need would. to like we would need to do something else with Frank D'Angelo in movies. Tell so. me about Good Pussy. <laughs> well, well, what do you want to know about a good pussy? Uh, I mean, I do have the book, uh, you know, in search of good pussy, living without love, but. Uh, um, I mean, okay, so well, we don't have much for it yet. It's okay. just, it's just an idea, it's just right? Just a fun now. premise. Just yep. a fun premise. The idea of it being uh, Frank D'Angelo would be would play uh, this cat 
who is a mob boss oh. in like the 1940s, 1950s, uh, the 50s, we'll say, the 50s. Uh, his big dream, though, he doesn't he doesn't want to be a gangster anymore. He doesn't want to be a mob boss anymore. He wants to go to Vegas and sing with the Cat Pack, and he wants to be a, lo- a lounge singer like his hero Frank Sinatra, and he wants to right. do that kind of stuff. And so the movie, this, this animated movie, uh, like I said, when I said like Think Favel Goes West, those kind of cats, like sophisticated, debonair, mm-hmm. dressed up in, like people cats, essentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, like the movie Cats, and uh, and so it'd be that. That's a gamble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fuck yeah, and uh, and so it would be the journey of him trying to like leave his mob life behind and then become this lounge singer, become this big famous singer. Uh, it would be all animated, and it would also be a musical that mm-hmm. all of it would all be done with Frank's music. In fact, it's shocking to me that he hasn't done a musical. In fact, it's even more shocking to me that he hasn't done a musical because in this book, here's the thing I wanted to tell you, Garrett. In this book. <laughs> When he's talking about his music career, he talks about how he wants to produce a Broadway musical about his life called Being Frank. Of course, of course. (laughs) And it's all I want in the world now. I just... Frank, if you're listening, I want you to make that musical. I will come see it. I would love it. That's that like sounds he means like a street. Broadway in, in Halifax, right? Yes, yeah. He means Broadway <laughs> Avenue or whatever the yeah, you know, whatever the street is in Halifax. He's not actually meaning like New York Broadway. Well, like he it. says that, but uh, yeah. realistically but he's, he's substituted Halifax for New York a lot. That's a <laughs> yeah, that's, that's an IMDB Hamilton, Hamilton. director trademark. Gotcha. <laughs> Uh, cause um, my guess is he shoots there all the time. Is that where in his Hamilton, movies are? Yeah. yeah Everything's done in Hamilton. Yeah. It's uh, and, but so Hamilton. We should get into this, his show business. Sure. Sum yeah. up his whole showbiz endeavors. Yeah. Here. And then we go back and we'll talk about the dark shit, but we'll, let's talk about his showbiz stuff first. <laughs> I feel like they should, I mean, do you want it to just be a fluff dive piece? And it warrants it, but I, I just love the idea of a celebration of it can Canadian be whatever. I did, weirdo, I did so Frank much D'Angelo. research on, on the dark shit, though. I have so, <laughs> Fair enough. so much but stuff. Like, but we don't have to talk about it. But listen, let's put our best thing, foot forward. But listen, the thing with the dark. talk about the Being Frank show. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I was going to say that the dark stuff is fine it. because you have a redemption after, right? That's true. Okay. So. Why don't I just rush through this dark stuff now? Let's just get this out of the way, and then we can get, much like Frank's life, we'll get this in the past, and then we'll move on to the future where it's bright and shiny. Okay. So. Uh, okay, I'm gonna here. eat pizza during this. So, <laughs> Frank D'Angelo, that, I think that makes me even more unaccountable, Frank, because I'm eating your cuisine to show that I stand mm-hmm. with Frank. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm going to say a lot of stuff here. Sure. Uh, Drasmos, you may want to cut this out at the end. I don't know. We'll see. Just we'll see how it. you feel about it. I never it. cut so, anything out. Oh, boy. Okay, so on June 9th, 2007, Frank was arrested. Damn. For the alleged sexual assault of a 21-year-old female who was the daughter of a business associate of his. Fuck. No names have been released. (laughs) That's the first one? (laughs) Yeah. So, well, this is the darkest stuff. So he was arrested for that. Uh, 2007 was a bad year for him. Mm -hmm. He got arrested for an alleged sexual assault. Mm -hmm. They they hosted, they sponsored the Grand Prix. That was great. But then he lost Steelback Brewery and D'Angelo Brands, Mm -hmm. which the next year his family had to buy back D'Angelo Brands. Um, So then... He was arrested. He was acquitted of the charges on April 21st, 2009. Okay. However, Judge John Hamilton said that while he found the evidence of D'Angelo and his accuser credible, that D'Angelo may be or is probably guilty of the crime, it just couldn't be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. <laughs> That's what the Justice John Hamilton said. That's not me saying that. That's Justice John Hamilton. Those yeah. are his words. Yeah. Uh, shortly after he was acquitted of the charges... Frank threw a party at the Forget About It Supper Club, and among the attendees was Mike Rutigliano and two Crown attorneys, Richard Bennett and Dominic Basil, who was uh, oh, and then uh, so uh, the uh, Mike Rutigliano was uh, one like a big member of the OPP, the Ontario Police Force. Mm-hmm. He was a big like. I don't know what he was. He wasn't like the chief, but he was like a big deal in, in the force there. Uh, you get sued for slander just for butchering his name like that. Well, how did you say it? Rutigliano? How was I? I don't know. I'm just te- I'm trying to bring some levity <laughs> in. I don't know. Let's just get through this stuff quick, all right? Uh, on May 14th of that year, Rutigliano was charged with attempting to influence the outcome of Frank D'Angelo's case. Oh, shit. They have audio transcripts of the two of them talking about how they want to get his case in front of a more lenient judge mm-hmm. and about how they want to get this, you know, get this judge in there who's going to like kind of get him off this, these charges. That's, hey. these are, these are facts. These are real things you 
you can look up. They're out there. The, on the, Wikipedia. Which, not on Wikipedia. I mean, on. On, do you want to believe that? Uh, do you want to believe Snowden? Come on. <laughs> researched articles, researched facts. So that was on May 14th. Rutigliano was charged with that. On May 15th, Frank was charged with obstruction of justice for allegedly attempting to rig the outcome of his sexual assault trial. Again, oh, allegedly, all sure, right? Sure. Allegedly. Uh, Those charges were stayed, motherfucker. Yeah. Sergeant Mike Rotigliano, he was a veteran OPP officer. He was charged with nine other offenses. He, this eventually ballooned to 17 charges against this OPP Unrelated officer. Unrelated to Frank. Unrelated to Frank. Right. One of the, only one of them was related to Frank. Uh, this guy, Mike Rotigliano, was also charged with allegedly trying to defraud Bombardier out of like $15 million. <laughs> oh, $13 million, sorry, $13 million. So... Uh, he, oh, Mike Rotigliano also has ties to the head of the Montreal Mafia, Vito Rizzuto. Uh, whatever. That's, that's a whole other thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, there were 17 charges laid against this police officer. One by one, they were all dismissed. <laughs> they were all thrown out of court, mostly due to the OPP's incompetence and in how they handled the case. Okay. So nothing happened with him. The charges were dropped against Frank. Uh, he was acquitted of the alleged sexual assault. And now he's just trying to put that all behind him. So we, we just, before we go any further, we just had to mention that stuff. We just had to get that out of the way so that you had a full picture of what Frank D'Angelo, what has happened to him in his mm-hmm, past mm-hmm. and the type of people that he knows and just, and, and that kind of stuff. So uh, anyway, that's all just. Right. Now hit no more blue. All right. Da, da, we'll da, start da, talking about Frank we'll do the B and Frank show. Whatever. <laughs> So anyway, I just I had to get that out of the way. I did a lot of research on that, and I didn't want to leave it on the on the side. So we just that's had to talk intense. About it. it is intense. He talks about the sex, the alleged sexual assault in the book, mm-hmm. and about how it was just a um, basically a, a defamation case to try to slander his character and uh, bring and down how, a powerful man. Yeah, and people were trying to take him down, and they didn't succeed. So so there you go. Wow. Uh, the yeah. Anyway, just had to get that out. Sorry, just had to say it. I just <laughs> well, now let's go to the guess the good stuff. Yes, yeah, yeah. Now the darkness. Let's is go the past. back to the good st- or the. the so now this guy's going to start cracking you up with his monologue yucks every week. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, his, his like clips where he superimposes himself into Trump's press conferences and like <laughs> asks not even silly questions, just like pointed questions mm-hmm. that don't get a response. <laughs> So you mentioned his show, uh, the Being Frank show. Yes. What was it like? Oh, who it's was still on. on. Oh, sorry. What well, is it? It's kind it of still on. on. It's it. kind of on a hiatus right now. I think. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it was a talk show. So basically, what what Frank did was he bought uh, an hour of paid advertising time at like eleven o'clock or at midnight on CHCH TV, which is a local Hamilton TV station. I think it's like like under the city TV banner. I think those are all a part of the I same. I think so. And yeah. like, and that's how it is now. We don't know maybe in its right. heyday. Yeah. Cause like for instance, there used to be a time where you could find every full episode on YouTube. Oh, Frank would shit. post the episodes in their entirety. Now they've all been wiped except for, I think three or four, like his old website used to have links that you could watch the videos oh. on. It was, uh, there was a brief window where he seemed to be kind of putting forward this, this show. He had uh, Chuck Claire on an episode. He had snow. He mm-hmm. was, he was tapped into the, he had, the wait, he <laughs> had Chuck Claire and snow on there. Goddamn right. He did. I think snow was on the very first episode. He was. Of being Frank. Yep. Oh my God. Licky yep. boom, boom down. Damn right. He was on there. <laughs> Yeah. Frank's had a lot of like if you some of the names that he's had on there like that Pacino clip that you saw yeah was taken from a whole episode devoted to an interview that he did with Al Pacino like a forty minute sit down interview I think they happened to be at the same film festival or something like that and I'm sure Frank buttered him up oh, with talk of being from Italy and loving his work and all those sorts of things Jeez. and it kind of culminated in this interview where uh, where Frank he he can't for the life of him not somehow make it about him. Like he's <laughs> interviewing the biggest name that you will ever get in front of a camera with you. And so many of your questions are via a story about yourself that Pacino doesn't want to listen to. And but so that's kind a- of the heart of his, his interviewing technique, which is mm-hmm. what makes his show great. It really is about being Frank. Even if you're a guest on it, it's about being it's Frank. It's about being Frank. That's fucking wild. And so what, Oh, sorry. I, so here's, I, the thing I, about, I, here's the thing about a CHCH show, just briefly. Yep, so sure. I don't know how it's always aired, but it currently airs, if you want to watch it, uh, Friday at 11.30 Eastern Time yep. um, on chch.com. You can watch their live feed. However, since it's paid programming, if you don't start the live feed before the time block that it's on, the feed will be unavailable. So if you click on it at like 11.31 – 
you can't watch the show. Yeah. If you're already watching the non-paid programming at like 11 o'clock and then it bleeds into the next program, then you can watch it. <laughs> but otherwise, you will not be able to access the program. So you get get there early, even if you're trying to watch his fucking talk show on <laughs> online. Why does that sound like, yeah, of course. Yeah, like of the, course. the only yeah, yeah. answer is, yeah, of course it would be. Yeah. <laughs> on the very first episode, he had Graham Greene. He had Snow and some Ooh. other person. I don't know who that Isn't was. Isn't Graham Greene an Academy Award nominee? He might be, yeah, for sure. I, I think mean, he was for Dances with Wolves. He's one of Canada's most celebrated uh, Aboriginal actors. So oh, crazy. It's a pretty big feather in, in Frank's cap. And yeah, snow. Other, I wish I hadn't have said it like that, but yeah. And snow. And snow, yeah. And snow was there as well. Bai Ling has been on the show. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Like he's had all his cronies. Yeah. Which will probably will convey into those guys next. Oh, but yeah. like, yeah, he he's had a lot of uh, musicians. He has comedians in the same way that like Johnny Carson would. But unlike most conventional talk shows where they'll kind of they'll sit behind the desk the host will and then they'll go and here's our comedian such and such and the comedian comes out and does their bit and then when it's over the host will come over and be like hey thanks for coming on the show or maybe invite them over to the couch frank instead stands it'll cut to this to him at the center of the stage with the comedian they'll have a minute of uncomfortable banter with each other and then he'll go okay do your do some comedy and then walks away <laughs> later. leaving him alone on the stage to start his routine him or her yeah. now that the crowd's warmed up and they're ready for laughs mm-hmm. it's, uh... <laughs> that's wild like he's just he's a man with no real good showbiz careful, instincts and careful. yet he's He's got interesting showbiz instincts. Better. He's got unconventional mm. show business instincts. Perfect. Yes. Well, that that <laughs> that works with the fact that most, like you said, most conventional shows. So his is definitely an unconventional show by Absolutely. the sounds of it. Yeah, it's it's filmed in the basement of his restaurant, former yeah. restaurant, the Forget About Supper Club. Which, when they first started the show, all the walls in the basement were lined with uh, old Playboy magazine covers, perfect, like framed Playboy mag. And then, like very quickly, they just had to take all those down because people were like, "We don't like this." <laughs> they got to get too rid fired of them for the the taping. <laughs> yeah, too well, much hooting during the show. Too he, much hooting. I mean, he had to be on camera. He didn't want to be fully torqued standing there in front of all in front of 20 of his friends and family so when you talk about his cronies is that just a bunch of yes men he surrounds himself with or is just his camp filled uh, with no we're talking about some legends of cinema <laughs> yeah. and, can, and certainly canadian television yeah as part um, of his crew uh as part of yeah his film crew and uh, presumably his friend crew yeah i mean he's here's one thing he's like good friends with phil esposito he does a lot of like uh talks yeah. with former nhl great phil esposito so um so. also dennis hall he he released a DVD mm-hmm. for Dennis Hall. Oh, All like Dennis Hall tells a bunch of his stories. It's called the Mo- the less famous Hall or, or the least famous oh. Hall or something like that. <laughs> That's great. And uh, yeah, it's just it's like a DVD where he just it's like this talking head interview thing where he's like, ah, and then at uh, the Canada Cup in 1981, it was, uh, it was <laughs> some big games there. And Stan Makita, he's a good guy. And <laughs> <laughs> have you seen it then? No, I'm oh, just like okay. the, that's how they advertise it. There's clips of it, and you go, oh. "Why would anyone spend 19.99 and shipping and handling for this?" <laughs> Me, that's why I'm I'm gonna spend it. Our Patreon money. Like we didn't even get that. into his sports stuff. Frank loves sports. He has a sports network online called yeah. NextSportsStar.com. NSS. Which, if you want to see what a front looks like, oh. check out NextSportsStar.com, <laughs> where I'm sure the most breaking news story is at least six weeks old. <laughs> Jerome McGinley yeah. retires. Like that's gonna be the headline. <laughs> Doug Gilmore sponsored by Lay's. <laughs> oh wow <laughs> ben johnson an energy drink commercial <laughs> so then are these uh, his his camp his crew his rich people that he surrounds himself with uh, rich in quotes yeah rich in quotes like yeah. just or just people yeah people that could potentially influence other people yeah, well, well they're, they're mostly actors like yeah it's, it's a, a sort of in the same way that wes anderson has his crew yeah his rogues that he always gallery pulls people from yeah. so too does frank like here i'll, I'll drop some names for Hit you and then a, we'll get into the, the the well we'll lure you in with some of these big names so you've got yeah. uh paul sorvino no. um you got james Kahn. you have mira you have sorvino mira sorvino got in the mix and too i'm sorry i stepped um, on you he did say james Kahn. james Kahn. Like the God, Scott Kahn's father, James Kahn. Uh, we have uh, Robert Loja of Big Fame. Oh, Raven um, Peace. We have uh, Doris Roberts, the mother from Everybody Loves Raymond. Yeah, Raven um, Power. Who else am I forgetting? Uh, Ed the Sock. <laughs> <laughs> we have Eric Roberts. We have Daniel Baldwin. Eric Roberts, yeah, definitely. Michael Madsen. Uh, Danny Aiello. Danny Aiello. Michael Madsen? Mm-hmm. What Michael Madsen, yeah. Fuck? Daniel Baldwin. Uh, mm-hmm. Michael Pare. Tony Nardi. Yeah. <laughs> now, now Ellen Dubin. Ellen Dubin, yeah. <laughs> oh, but Dominique Swain. That's yeah. another like, legitimate name. Mm-hmm. Holy Welcome fuck. to the crew. Fuck. 
And he, uh, have all of these people been in his movies? Margot oh, Kidder? Yeah, Margot Kidder, Raven <laughs> Power. All these people have not only been in his movies, but have been in multiple, all of his movies, basically. They all pretty much have the same cast, just playing a different roles. A lot of roles. them, so we mentioned the D'Angelo curse, a lot of them were in Frank's movies until they died. Yes. Like for a lot of them, the last project they would work on would be a Frank D'Angelo yeah. film. Several of his movies end with a, like, in memoriam. Martin Landau. Oh, Martin Landau, oh, Martin Landau yeah. Raven oh my Power. God. Raven what? Power, baby. Yeah, he's dead. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. Does it explain in the book how on earth he's no. gathered that crew? No, the, the book is all pre-movie. Yeah. Like, this is where we kind of rediscovered it with the yeah. same sort of reaction you're having, where the guy that we remembered from the fucking dorky <laughs> energy drink commercials where he goes, oh, I'm not allowed to be on camera anymore, is now putting out a movie a year mm. with advertised budgets of more than $5 million and featuring tons of recognizable names. Yeah. And the product is off the wall ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. It's... And so does he direct, write, pro- like? <clears throat> so he is he is the writer, the director, the producer, the star, the score, or like he does the score for yeah, them. All the music is going to be original songs Everything. or covers. Or in, covers. In, Sicilian, in his movie Sicilian Vampire, his name is listed 154 times in the credits. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fact. Now, <laughs> to contextualize it, a lot of those are like four credits for one song yeah, where it'll yeah. be like written by, performed by, right. copy written yeah. by. Still, yeah. That's fucked. Yeah. <laughs> That's so fucked. They're long credits, too. Oh, <laughs> man. Just watching Frank's name. Just scro- Sometimes his name will be the only thing on the screen, just scrolling through. Well, but he was, you know, he's literally the owner of every place that was filmed. Yeah. To like. Yeah, he films he films most things in you know the, what was the former forget about it supper club and uh, presumably Mama D's as well. That's his kind of mm-hmm. like uh, home cooking Italian restaurant, mm-hmm. uh, like a diner type of thing, I believe. Uh, we haven't eaten at these places, obviously, but and one of them's closed, or all of them are closed. No, one of them. The forget about it supper club is closed. Yeah, Mama D's is Mama still D's around, is open with strange hours, but yeah, and also there's like another restaurant in a in like another city in southern Ontario called Mama D's, and so I don't know when you Google it, you usually find this Caribbean restaurant called Mama D's. <laughs> yeah. That's not and it's Frank's also a restaurant. Surprisingly industrial area. Yeah, where Mama D's is like there's not other restaurants and stuff around, but I wonder if it's the same area that they filmed all those scenes for the Big Fat Stone in. Like I wonder if that's yeah. like Mama D's is like around the corner of that, or maybe they're filming in Mama D's for the Big Fat Stone. There I could wonder. be. I mean, like I say, Frank, Frank's right to list himself as like the props master because it's his stuff. He <laughs> yeah. could list himself as like the location scout because he went to all the places and went, yeah. He walked around, he walked a block in like, Hamilton. <laughs> these are legitimate <laughs> credits. I don't know why you're trying to denigrate a man who wears many hats, but <laughs> Frank is a man. I, I, Frank, Frank is a man who the characters he plays in his movies often bleed into his real life. He mm-hmm. never had his ears pierced, and then he got he had his ear pierced in a movie, mm-hmm. and now he just wears a diamond stud in his ear all the time. <laughs> yeah. So, like, you know, he just the, which the, movie? Oh, fuck, I don't remember which one it is, but uh, maybe Sicilian Vampire. Yeah, I think he had a pierced ear in Sicilian Vampire. That seems right. I mean, it could have been for real gangster. So let's let's briefly touch. Let's not get into the movies too deep. Jesus because- Christ! Hey, <laughs> okay, tune into our go to our Patreon to hear yes, all about the movies. Exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll give you the deep. You want deep dives on each individual feature in excruciating detail, like and the scene CDs. for scene. It's Gus Van yep. Sant level insanity where we're just taking <laughs> these and every scene. Yeah, and, no, and the and the albums too is the other is the yes. same podcast, right? Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah, so get into let's get into some of these movies just okay. in terms of just so titles and should we just list them off first and then we can go back and kind of talk about them all? Oh, let's just quickly okay. there's right, right. Real Gangsters first from 2013, I think. I'm not going to be able to help you with this. There's Doesn't just matter. Yeah, it's who about, cares? about 2013. But, yeah, it's his 20, good fellas. 2013 it's his is when, like Sorry, I'm just going to say this real quick. 2013 is when okay. he started making movies. Okay. And so every movie we're about to list has come out in the last six years. Jesus. All right. Okay. So just, just for context for that. So, yeah. And they all have an accompanying soundtrack of individual songs. Yeah. And usually. So his in, musical output matches his film, but it actually exceeds it because he's put out some extra albums along mm-hmm. the way. Mm-hmm. And several of his movies have like two to three soundtracks. Like Sicilian mm-hmm. Vampire, I think, has three soundtracks or something like he that. He says so. that, but I don't know. When I was listening <laughs> yeah, to each album, I didn't, they're not all listed as soundtrack. No, that's but. very true. Um, so yeah, real gangster. He has a lot of club mixes. It's like he uh-huh. hits a phase where he starts introducing the idea of a club mix and it really opens up his catalog. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I like it, it, it's, I love watching Sicilian vampire 
because there's a scene where they're, they're all like the kids are dancing in a club to his song. I want to live forever. The club mix. And they're all just singing along to it and like dancing. <laughs> and it's just this like surreal, like what world is this where yeah. this is happening? So, but yeah, uh, real gangsters is his first one that like Garrett said is like his good fellas. It's all about ga- We're real fucking gangsters. That's yeah. how it starts. Yeah, like yeah, that's yeah. one of the yeah, opening they say lines. Fuck a ton. They say cocksucker a ton. They say cocksucker 25 times. I think in it I, on our show, Frankie these cocksuckers, we have a cocksucker count. So every right. every project he does, I keep track of how many times people are called cocksuckers, and then uh, and then we say it at the end. So uh, uh, Real Gangsters is the high water mark right. with like Easily. 20 some. So I didn't even notice a cocksucker in Last Big Save. So I don't think there was one. Yeah, I don't one. think so. No. One of one of the opening lines of Real Gangsters <laughs> is the finality of life sucks a big fucking cock. Nope. Nope. <laughs> The reality of life, or the finality of the life. Finality of the life. finality of life sucks a big fat cack. That's how he oh, says oh, it. Yeah. Oh, he, he doesn't say it. Pardon me. No, he says yeah. fat. Yeah. He says cack. The big fat, big fat <laughs> cack. Yeah. That's why it's called cack. the cacks. Frankie D's cack suckers. Cack suckers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um. So there was that. That was followed up by the big fat stone, mm-hmm. which is which a, is kind a, of a crime. It's a crime procedural intercut with like a sort of whimsical fantasy rags to riches story. Yeah, about a, but good a homeless boy. guy who and. Is, has a windfall of cash mm-hmm. in that a giant, the, a giant gem falls on his chest after a failed robbery. And then he goes to a pawn shop and then somehow he's just a billionaire for that. So don't worry. Don't think about it too hard. There's some, right. there's some twists and turns in there. There's a real yeah. Shyamalan twist at the <laughs> end. It's, it's, I, w- it's, I wouldn't it's expect deep. anything less at this it's, point. It's deep. Yeah. Frank also has two types of characters, and by this point, he will have portrayed both of them. One of them <laughs> is the tough Italian guy, yep. and the other is the meek, uh, like good boy, which is kind of a term that we use for someone who seems to be lacking mentally, but they're they have a good heart that gets them through life to make mm. up for any lacking intellect. Right, um, and those are kind of his two characters. Yep. That's his version of the under underdog. Uh, that's his yeah, version, kind th- of an underdog. Like that's his version of radio. I think. Okay. Yeah. 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 Like that. That's well. <laughs> I mean, radio is pretty. He's a good boy. He's a good boy. I don't think anyone would question if, like, radio is surface level. Forrest Gump, I think, is the typical <laughs> bar that. Oh, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I am boy. Sam, and yeah, yeah. Any of those good boys. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I am Sam, and his whole crew. They're all just. <laughs> <laughs> you would never know to look at them. Yeah, the ringer, uh, whatever. Well. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's like this meek character that's always kind of like, oh, thank, thanks, Mr. Versi. Oh. Mr. Versi's on Art Hindle, who we didn't even mention, oh, a yeah. real icon. Yeah, Art <laughs> Hindle's in a bunch of his, don't worry. Yeah, yeah we didn't mention all the Canadian big names. He's got a, he's also got a real core of Canadian talent. <laughs> um, Ellen Dubin. No, oh, uh, my love. Michael Pere. That one guy who's like the brother or cousin in uh, Real Gangsters, who I don't know. Yeah. That weird looking like Russian guy that plays all the villains until oh, yeah. the most recent one where he looks really put together. John Ashton who's is in there too. Mm-hmm. Kim Coates, I think, is one of is in one yeah, of the Yeah, we're starting movies. to scrape the yeah. bottom of the barrel with names. Yeah, here. pretty hardcore. <laughs> there's there's a lot of people. But we led with James Conn. That's a that's a good one to start off that's with. That's a big yeah. one to so, start with. So yeah. they start getting introduced around this point, I think, because the next one is uh, No Deposit which is going to introduce Michael Madsen. It's going to get Daniel Baldwin in the mix. Yeah. Um, it's going to introduce Frank, anti-Semitism. <laughs> Frank teases <laughs> that he's not going to be the main character for the first 30 minutes, and then he takes over the rest of the movie <laughs> and is the main character the whole way through. Is and the hero. The hero. Yep. Kind of like his show. Yeah. yeah. If, if you don't have time to watch the movie, go watch the trailer. It will literally tell you everything beat by beat <laughs> and just cuts out the boring dialogue. Like So you can see the whole thing. That's what Frank thinks trailers are, yeah. is just show the entirety of the movie in two and a half minutes. Yeah. But also, no deposit is also like an hour and seven minutes. So if yeah. you don't have that kind of time, then like loosen and up your awesome. fucking schedule. It's probably his yeah, best yeah, one. Yeah. Well, we have different opinions on that, but I, I love No Deposit's it's way up there with me. And that's the one that opens with the Obama impression. So that's oh, okay. pretty yes. nice too. Yeah. Does he have a thing? Yeah, an, does he have a sure. thing where like he makes sure that he always wins? Like, you know, Vin, oh, yeah. Vin Diesel's got it in his every yeah, yeah. single one of his contracts. He doesn't lose a fight. And I think The Rock's no. at that point too. Yeah. D'Angelo is the same thing yeah. where. He always wins. He's oh, always the but, smartest guy in the room. He always out manipulates people, out maneuvers yeah. people. Yeah. But he's he still the, the most problems. humble. He's the most <laughs> like humble man in the world. That's the wow. conundrum of it. Yeah. He wants to be the most humble at the same time. But he's still <laughs> like, the fucking best. And if you challenge him in any kind of way, yeah. he will eat your fucking ass for lunch. Wow. He will destroy you on film if you even challenge him a little bit. But he's very humble. He's a good man. He ultimately, he's a good man. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, yeah. 
And so after No Deposit came Sicilian Vampire, which might have been the first Ooh. one that we watched to be like, holy shit, Frank D'Angelo is making movies. No, the first one that we watched and was The Joke Thief. Or for me anyway. Yeah. I, I saw The Joke Maybe. Thief first. Yeah. <laughs> Who even knows anymore? <laughs> yeah, it's all I've seen it's all, all of them mess. multiple times. <laughs> I know. That's the other thing. We have spent days of our lives consuming Frank D'Angelo content. Like, yeah. it's it's disturbing. <laughs> it's Why? It's just so fascinating. Yeah. It's so enjoyable. you can't go back. What are you going to watch like – like you talked about the Marvel Cinema. What am I going to watch one of those movies knowing that Frank D'Angelo's out there making something that will <laughs> defy all convention while at the same time trying to be mass appeal and down the middle? <laughs> How do you miss the easiest marks? Like you set the lowest bar and you smash into it repeatedly. It's excellent. <laughs> and knock your teeth out on it. <laughs> all right. Yeah, no, you like win. Like Sicilian win. Vampire is that. It's, it's unbearable. It yeah, has a premise where you go – all right, you can do something with this. A gangster who's also a vampire. Mm -hmm. Cool. How did he become a vampire? Oh, a bat flew out of a box of bananas and bit him on the <laughs> neck. Oh, okay, he's a vampire now. Okay. It's also the most insufferable. You have to see it just to see how awful his character is. He yeah. makes him so unpleasant. Yeah. Beyond any level that you can conceive of, like, but I don't think he would view it that way. No, he's, enough. he's busting balls. He's just, he's just a, one of the guys. He's busting balls. He's locker just a room hard talk. dude, but like, yeah. fuck, is he just cruel and unrelenting yeah. and just? And the movie's long. It's man. like two hours and a change, I think. Like, it's a, it's a long one. Is but that his like big feature? Like, I'm this, putting every, like this is this is yes. my moment. This is my. I, I think thing. this was Frank's like. Ch like shot at Hollywood. I it like, had yeah. the biggest uh, reported budget. Yeah, I think of ten million. James Conn enters the cast yep. at this point. James Conn plays. And James Conn plays a lot of ass kissing as a character too. Frank D'Angelo <laughs> talking about what a great person kind of playing he is. himself. Holy and fuck. like James Conn, uh, his whole character is he he finds out that he's a he's like a a, a forensic investigator, but also a professor of like mythology. Also yeah, and also yeah, a he's doctor. Like a, yeah, he's a medical doctor, but he also knows all about like mythology. Yeah, and so his so whole he can thing, do blood transfusions, but he can know if you're a vampire. <laughs> right. <laughs> and his whole thing is that he just wants to become a vampire. So he's yeah. just constantly begging Frank, just give me a little nibble. Just give me a trying nibble. Trying to be subtle. Just give me a little bite. Just a little, just a little snip, you know, a little snip snip. And Frank's like, I'm not going to do that for you. And he's like, please, God. Shows up at his house and he's just like, please, just give me a little nibble. He's an old man. So, but anyway, that's, that's the kind of shit that he made James Conn do, just grovel to him. And oh like, my God. all of these, I have a theory about Frank's movies and his working relationship with the actors in them, especially people like Robert Loja and James Conn. Yeah. Anytime someone like that, someone with clout, someone like who is like iconic in, 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 you know, certain fields, anytime those people appear in the movie, they, it, it's just Frank getting to meet his heroes and then talking to them like they're his heroes. So like in Real Gangsters, Robert Loja plays his uncle. Right. And he, j Frank just showers praise on Robert Loja and Robert Loja showers praise on Frank D'Angelo. But it's none of it means anything. It's a key component. <laughs> exactly, right. yeah. None of it amounts to anything though, but it's just. It's like. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. It's go like ahead. that Nathan for you bit where he has the girl that he's acting with say I love you over and over again to him until he's just feeling it for real. <laughs> that's what Frank tries to capture, but, but in one take because he's not doing it over and over again. <laughs> yeah. Here's, so that's why he gets professionals because he knows they'll fucking nail it and saying that you're a genius. Like the first time you see James Caan, he's like shakes Frank's hand being like you're, you're, you've saved my life. You're the best thing to ever happen to me. You look so good. Your skin is so smooth. And like <laughs> Your skin's like a baby's thing. ass. That's what he says. Your skin's like a baby's ass. So, and this that movie went kind of viral, so it, it it caught some people's attention. So articles exist that have headlines like, you know, a movie that that has ruined the legacy of James <laughs> Caan. Why is James <laughs> Caan stooped so low to be in this amateurish vampire film? <laughs> like, there's a whole sub thing of Frank and bot accounts on Twitter. I think that he's purchased things before, and based on inputted words that he's used and people have written about him. There's now Twitter accounts that have names like the film that ruined James Conn's career, the vampire film that ruined James Conn's <laughs> career, like, and the location just saying like another line from the article. It's just like a broken bot thing that's just searching for D'Angelo words <laughs> and creating accounts, but some of them are damaging to his reputation. Right. Here's here's some stuff about James Conn. Uh, from articles that I've read about about that. For here's from a 2016 article in the Toronto Sun. James Conn is quoted as saying during his divorce proceedings from his fourth fourth wife, I am no longer willing to take part in films and or, and or television shows which detract from the 50 years I've spent building my reputation, he stated in court papers in January obtained by TMZ. 
One of the movies Khan regrets signing on for was Sicilian Vampire. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, it goes on to say, Khan recalls only about 50 people showing up for the New York City premiere, which he insisted in court documents was humiliating. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck! <laughs> well, I've seen footage of that premiere, and it is happening in like a back room, like it's a yeah. brick wall area that's quarantined off with a curtain. It looks like a makeshift sort of like dealing with a zombie apocalypse situation, <laughs> where they've quarantined off an area of a building that wasn't meant for what it's being used for. But I also say fuck James Caan. <laughs> he went on to do every other Frank D'Angelo movie. He never said no. And this Frank was well, he, he after went, Sicilian Vampire. After Sicilian yeah. Vampire, that's when this came out. But okay, so wait. No, no, no. He was I a mean, major like he, role in Red Maple Leaf. Yeah, that's true. So he still signed on for his movies then after. He still signed on for one more. He did Red Maple Leaf. I don't think he did The Neighborhood. I don't think he's done like, anything since then. We but say he, signed on, but I think it's just a handshake deal. I think a lot of these are cash on the day. Mm-hmm. Th- th- that's yeah. a big part of the incentive. Like, okay, so. And I, if he I, shoots I, once, like if he does one take and that's it. One you take, probably one get, day. Yeah, yeah it's, and, a, it's a weekend in Canada. And you make a couple grand probably. Yeah. Well, okay, yeah. so it Frank pays scale and then some. That's what they say. In And it's in cash. The, it's in several articles. He pays in cash. Uh, in one of the articles, and the author described watching Frank count out Margot Kidder's cash payment to her <laughs> while she was in the makeup chair. <laughs> I love I, it. Before we go too much further, though, I want to come back. There's a couple more James Caan things I want to oh, touch yeah, on please. here. A couple of great little quotes. Uh, here's, a, here's from a Vanity Fair article about James Caan and the Sicilian Vampire premiere. The feeling was less that of a festival screening and more of a private event for cast, crew, and friends. At one point, one of the actresses got out her phone and took a flash photo of herself on screen, which I think is just the funniest fucking image of an actress just like taking like a flash photo. So everyone's sitting there and yeah. Um, But so then, so James Conn said those things and it was like, you know, Frank D'Angelo always took it pretty hard. But then uh, in a February 24th, 2016 article by Jonathan Gatehouse from McLean's, Frank would get Con on the phone to talk about what happened there. And this is James Con's quote about uh, the, the comments that he made earlier that are in court documents. On the, in that conversation. Yeah. It's some stupid friggin' post about shit that never came out of my mouth, he says. Shooting vampire was fun. More like a reunion with old friends than work. It's why I agreed to return in January to do the Red Maple Leaf. Frank's a complete maniac, he says. He's fun to be around. Mm-hmm. The product is the product. People go thinking they're going to see Hamlet. They're not. But there's nothing wrong with that, says Con. <laughs> Frank tries his heart out, and I think that's the most important thing. <laughs> so I love it. I mean, James Con appeared on an episode of the Being Frank show for an hour long interview. <laughs> yeah. They talked about The Godfather for probably 35 minutes of it. <laughs> Because I'm my guess is didn't that, spend that's a lot of time talking movie. about Sicilian Vampire. His favorite movie. He, he probably knew it wasn't going to be super complimentary. No, of course not. It's just some <laughs> stupid friggin' post about shit that never came out of his mouth. So. Frank's a maniac. <laughs> <laughs> it's the nicest thing he could say in his press release. I, there's some there's some real funny quotes about people describing Frank that I got. There's some there's some, and like a lot of great quotes from Frank. So right. Um, so his favorite movie is what. Well, in in Sicily, in uh, Real Gangsters, they have a moment where him and his two pals are sitting around a table chatting about movies. Right. And uh, Frank says, like, you know, my people would think my favorite movie is The Godfather. It's not The Godfather. The Godfather's good, but it's not my. It's not the best movie. The best movie is The Deer Hunter. Oh, so that's I guess that's his favorite movie. So kind of Still subverting expectations. Well, you that's know? you know that's Jack's favorite movie. Giacomino, yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't want to shock you, but these. These are characters. It's not Frank <laughs> what? No, what? No, that's not true. I don't believe that for a second. The uh, next movie was a political thriller yes. called The Red Maple Leaf that was about um, like sort of dip- diplomatic relations uh, when the uh, ambassador to Canada's daughter is kidnapped. In like Toronto? Oh. Sounds mm-hmm. like Rush Hour. And, yeah. <laughs> that's ex- yeah, that's exactly what it is. There's a lot of is. sex and intrigue in it. It's a, yep. it's an interesting one. Ellen Dubin and gives Martin Roadhead. He, gets, he does his first one there. Mm-hmm. And his last one, I think. I think he died after Maybe. that Maybe. I'm pretty sure And Robert died. Loja is in the throes of his dementia in that one. That's the roughest yeah. one. Oh, yeah. man. I have, I have some real big feelings about the treatment of Robert Loja and Frank D'Angelo's movies that I've, I've expressed on other shows, so I won't get all worked up about it now, but... Robert Loja Well, and was, in that scene where he's super messed, doesn't Doris Roberts call him like a cocksucker or something like that? 
uh, like, some, maybe. She says, don't listen for a fucking second what your cocksucking father no, thinks no, no, or no, something no. She like says, that. She says, don't you give a flying fuck about what your father has to say. Okay. Yeah. And then Doris Roberts died. Trying to cocksuckers where there's no oh, shit. Yeah. She died later Martin on. Martin Landau and, says cocksucker, though. You bet he does, yeah. He calls a child a cocksucker, I think. <laughs> I think he does. He yeah. calls the young ambassador that. <laughs> yeah. Young Michael Pare. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the, yeah, what that, was after that? Oh, uh, the neighborhood. Af- after that was the neighborhood, which we haven't discussed on the show yet. We haven't gotten mm-hmm. to that. In fact, I haven't I even seen that one. Yeah, yet. I, I've seen the neighborhood. I don't really remember. It. I was very high. I don't really remember much about it. But uh, but that one, I'm looking forward to seeing that one. After that, he put out uh, the joke thief, okay. which is where Frank's effort started to really slip. He, he, <laughs> oh, it was that at this point. <laughs> yes, it was at that. Okay. He was at least trying with those other movies. Yeah. Uh, this movie is where he goes like, wait a minute, I can just coast. I don't have to work that yeah, hard. It, it, it represents the trend that the next two movies, well, this movie and the next one will have, yeah, which presumably is... Presumably the next one. I can build a movie around an event, film the event, and make that the bulk of my movie, yeah. and just do a little story around it. So the joke thief, the, he put together a very low-end comedy show. Mm-hmm. At the Forget About Supper Club. that's the heart of the movie. Mm-hmm. And so, and the, but the rest of the movie is just Frank in a cab on the way to the show talking with the cab driver about his life. That's so, it? That's it. So it's just Frank in a car driving, like flashback scenes and then intercut with comedy from the show that Frank is going to. And that's, Frank sits for 70 minutes of this movie probably. Wow. It's, and he does that, do stand up in it. Well, he, he tells a joke. A joke. Thief. He, he is the titular joke thief. Huh? The crux of the movie is... I should be allowed to be famous, even though I knowingly <laughs> steal jokes. And eventually the industry agrees. <laughs> <laughs> and a hero is born. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, uh, and and then, now he's got, yeah, two two in the bank that he's doing some well, festivals. Like, that's another thing about Frank is he takes these movies to festivals that have names that make you think – they're a major festival. Like he goes to this one called like the New York international film festival or the international New York film festival, whichever one Mm. isn't the legitimate one. There's like a legitimate (laughs) one. And then there's another one that just finagles the words around and they're all kind of like, I mean, I I can't say this for sure, but I've got my hunches that they're sort of pay to play kind of things where if you give enough, when you submit your entry, you're probably going to find yourself with some awards when all is said and done. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. he has won all kind, like the Action Film Festival Award. He's a multiple time winner oh, of that. Yeah. Uh, all and all, and, he, and all of the posters for the movie, like the neighborhood, is just covered in like he all these awards that he's won and just like everything that he's that this movie's accomplished. Those little leaves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The little wreaths right. and like. If you Google them, you'll go, what the fuck are any of these things? <laughs> and like to even look at the movie, the other movies that were there, you go, okay, well, like these all look like they were shot on like a cell phone. Like, you know, just like yeah. these are all dog shit. And then the neighborhood stands out above the rest. So, right, right, right. and Frank gave the most money to them, I would imagine. So just allegedly, allegedly he yeah, paid his we way. Don't know that for sure. We don't know. They might have been, hey, they might have come to him and said, you're one of the finest. You're one of the hardest working filmmakers. Like I don't know why Frank hasn't gotten into the 420 awards. I feel like he would be. He he is the perfect. <laughs> that's another fit. deep dive for another day. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, Derek Savage. We don't. We don't have Derek time. Savage and Cool Cat. Do you know about Derek? <laughs> oh no, sorry. I just I, I, thought, I thought you were talking to him. No, I don't. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Well, that's another thing. That's that's a story for another day. That's another one for another yeah. time. And then uh, uh, you said, so after the, la- um, then the most recent one and one more. Yeah. So the most recent one is the last big save that just right. came out on Amazon prime, like last week or mm-hmm. a couple weeks ago. Uh, that one is, um, yeah. Like you described, like, like well, I told you, you described to me, yeah. it was about 20 minutes of movie and about 40 minutes of just a hockey game that you watch. <laughs> um, and then it ends and then there's 12 minutes of credits after that. And a lot that- of credits. And then a song that he wrote about hockey <laughs> 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 he included like a windows movie maker video for at the end. The movie's an hour and five minutes long. His character doesn't factor into the, the hockey game really at all. He's like in any there. kind of way. Yeah. He's just a part of it. So <laughs> it's, it's it's interesting. It's, it's and they curse so much more that like you if yeah. you watch the trailer, you would think it's like a fa- an uplifting family movie about mm-hmm. an underdog who's given a second chance. I put the movie on, and like the third word is like this fucking guy yeah. is gonna fucking ruin everything. <laughs> like they're just cursing. Like within 
15 seconds ago, well, this is a hard R now. Like they've oh, said yeah. too many Fox. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. And then they drop a big C as well later on. So yep. at, uh, and that, that might be my favorite scene in the movie and also featuring my favorite character in the movie, Frank's wife. Dominic yeah, well, Swain we is. mentioned that he has a proclivity to make to give himself some pretty attractive wives. <laughs> yeah, oh, he yeah. is. He's romanced Daryl uh, Hannah. Oh, of course. He's romanced Dominique mm-hmm. Swain. Oh, yeah, I completely forgot Daryl Hannah was in there. Yeah, yeah. she's in Sicilian Vampire as his wife. No, uh, is it whatever? Who gives yep. a fuck? Yeah. Yep. Um, those two. What else? Uh, Luna the Clown from uh, Big Comfy yeah, Couch. From Big Comfy what? Couch. She's yep. the love interest in the Joke Thief. Mm-hmm. What? Mm-hmm. She's Holy still a babe shit. too. Goddamn, Luna. She is. I like her short yeah. little haircut. It's mm-hmm. cute. She's very cute. What the fuck, man? Uh, who, he's got he's flirtatious with Margot Kidder, which like yeah. Margot Kidder has the mouth of a monkey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And she's uh, no, she, and there's some like Canadian actress that plays his Ellen girlfriend Dubin. in No Deposit. That's a, a a good looking one as well, but I can't remember her name. Oh yeah, I'm um, so sorry. She can go. Kind of looks to, like Deborah Messing, but it's go, not Deborah Messing. She can go straight to fucking hell because I'm going uptown. So then it seems like with the actors that he's a big fan of and the actresses that he wants to sleep with, he just <laughs> creates these fantasy worlds so he can live out. Yeah. whatever he wants, yeah. right? So he's like, he wants to create a friendship or force a friendship with James Caan yeah. by having them in a scene together saying how great the other one is and how important the other one is to themselves. And then he takes it, runs with it and being like, James Caan thinks I'm the greatest person, right? Like, oh, yeah. It, it like, seems like it's this weird, twisted, delusional fantasy world that he creates. Well, those are your words. But, oh, no, <laughs> exactly. I think the part of it is that he's bizarrely method in yeah. that... Yeah. He doesn't write a script nope. like the, the some fascinating episodes of the being Frank show are his behind the scenes looks at his movies or even the credit sequence of the joke thief mm-hmm. shows some like <laughs> cut sequences that you think are going to be people laughing and having fun. But 70 percent of them are Frank getting very upset and making people <laughs> uncomfortable with his intensity <laughs> because Frank's way that he makes a movie is that it's all in his head. And then when you're filming your scene, he's going to give you kind of a rough idea. Like Tony Nardi described it. This uh, is a rough paraphrasing of what he said. But Tony Nardi, who's been in, I think, all the movies. No, he, uh, he's maybe he, Real Gangsters. Yeah, he wasn't in Real Gangsters. Um, he described the process as it's like jumping out of a plane without, but without a parachute. And then when you're convinced that you're going to hit the ground and die, someone throws you a parachute and you just get it on and open up in just enough time to save your life. <laughs> and that's the nicest way he could think of describing working with Frank D'Angelo. Cause I listen, I go, what does that even mean? Like you just get by on the skin of your teeth and you hate the whole experience. That's what that sounds like to me. Well, see, and that's what sounds very similar to like a Tom, like the Tommy Wiseau, the infamous Tommy Wiseau scenario with yeah. the room, right? Where, Nobody knew what the hell was going on. This money was coming in from God knows where. There's this guy that is just delusional beyond belief about like what he's doing, how he's going about doing it. And it just it just ends up happening by the skin of everyone's teeth. For right? sure. Like oh, it, yeah. That, that's why it sounded – like just what, as you were originally describing him, I was just like this sounds really familiar. Yeah, yeah. And then I remember passing the thumbnail for the disaster artist on right. Netflix and I was like – Fuck! This is him, right? Yeah. Like, the, or or close <laughs> yeah. to that. They're kissing cousins, kind of. Yeah. yeah. Like, whereas there's I, less there's less whimsy to Frank D'Angelo. I'd yes. say there's that's a, a good lot more grit. Yeah. yeah. Um, Frank he uh, he he spares no expense. Usually, though, he rents the like Sony Red cameras or whatever they are that mm-hmm. are like hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're like six K cameras. They're these fucking insane cameras to watch his movies. You don't really get that impression. Like right. They don't. They don't look like they were shot on six K cameras. But he usually shoots with six to eight cameras at the same time. Each one is pointed at a different angle on on the the scene. They do one to two takes and then they move on. Holy fuck! That's it. That's how it's done. They set up six and then they just boop, 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 do it. And he he prides himself on that. He he brags about how like yeah these Hollywood productions take three months to shoot and then a year of edits. We get it all done in like two weeks. <laughs> We, we, we like, we, we, we film the movie in like five days and then we edit it and it's done. But and there's then, something to be said for that where you like, you hear about the, like the dogma filmmakers and stuff like that. The ones who have this sort of ethic behind filmmaking and using natural locations and natural light and doing away with the idea of a huge crew that you just, that you streamline the process and boil it down to a story there's something weirdly similar in what Frank is doing. Mm-hmm. He just doesn't have a story. He just starts with such a loose fabric of what a story is <laughs> that it never unravels into something more. It's just a series of conversations around fairly basic plot points. 
and then it ends. And then a lot of his music. Like I, well, I, 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 I was going to say that that seems to be exactly the way one would describe his music mm-hmm. is that it's just a bunch of stuff. And then you just have no idea where it's going and what the point of it all is, but it's just there. Yeah. And then it eventually just tapers off. Yeah. 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 And that's maybe, that's, but I would say he's more like the clash and that he's put out music in every genre at this point. He mm-hmm. has an album full of like nursery rhymes. He's, uh, really? I think that he's yeah. just, yeah. it's a bullia base. Oh, the world. Yeah. Like we can't even get into his music now because oh, we'll be here forever. Well, forever, okay. So yeah. Yeah. I just, I want to read this choice quote, uh, from Joanna Schneller in the Globe and Mail about, mm-hmm. uh, the filming of uh, one of his movies. Mm-hmm. He uses the same crew from his talk show, stands hard by the director of photography and shouts action right in his ear. <laughs> that was just, <laughs> it's a funny way to describe what he does so <laughs> oh man um i okay, i know the the music stuff will take a while we already talked about it on the on the last one um or when we recorded yeah. before this so how many albums does he have at 15. this point 15 15 full 15 albums. Yeah. yeah 15 something like that yeah well yeah. when you say full albums a lot of them are just like like especially later on it's yeah. it's songs from other albums and then a couple of new ones sprinkled in so like some like compilation the best example of that but not Labeled as compilations, right? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, not at all. Labeled the best as example new example is his his Christmas album features songs like his cover of Hallelujah, um, <laughs> oh, like oh a God. love song that he has on one of his albums. That's just yep. like slow enough and is about like loving, and maybe he says season in it at one point. So he's like, you know what, that can be on the the Christmas. <laughs> well, one he says too. we all like need a little a, spice, and he went, nah, that season's close enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, slow down and grab a slice, and I meant of you know fruit fruit cake. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, okay, so like the music part obviously is the part that I got into because yeah. I haven't seen the movies yet, yeah, yeah. and we were talking about it before. Yeah, it's, it's being just, a word that I like to hear. What was that? Uh, the word "yet" is what I like to hear. Yes, mm, yet. It suggests yeah. that you are going to be watching these films. My man. I, listen, I'm actually intrigued because yeah. I, you know what I, I like. Again, uh, the room I've watched a yep. lot. Yeah, I yeah. think it's hilarious. I think the story is funny as fuck. Mm-hmm. I think like how bad it is. Like I like bad movies. Yeah. Oh, um, and I like B movies, C movie, whatever. Like if it's just, if it's sometimes they hit that right thing where it's actually really entertaining. Like Birdemic. Garrett, I know Garrett's a huge mm-hmm. fan of the Birdemic movies and it's, oh, it yeah. kind of falls, yeah. falls into a similar vein. Yeah. Well, it, it, but it is bad in a different way, but yes. it's, it's enjoyable in that you will not be able to pin down the instincts of the person creating it. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. if you want to be sort of actually surprised that a movie, even if the surprise is nothing more than you're going to have them say or do that, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you will get that out of, out of this movie. There's not, I mean, they're simultaneously super conventional and then also just completely ridiculous. And like even a movie like Sicilian vampire, which is over two hours long, most of it is boring and terrible. Sorry, Frank. The middle chunk, the beginning is great. The middle is awful, Mm -hmm. but then the ending is fucking awesome like i love the ending uh, of sicilian vampire it's it's a delight him just a gigolo is good well yeah he does do a cover of just a gigolo which oh, is perfect. arguably one of my favorite frank d'angelo songs it's <laughs> it is it's and like his he not only does he not only does he do a cover of it they perform the song in full in sicilian vampire spoiler alert for everybody at home yeah. but like I think oh, it's fine. Like Danny Aiello oh, sings fuck. on. Like, was, yeah. We forgot to mention uh, um, Armand DeSante is oh, in his crew. Yeah, Armand DeSante, oh, wow. my from, dude. From the Sopranos. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robert Davi yeah. from our favorite movie in the world, Showgirls, mm-hmm. is in his uh is in there as well. Oh fuck, Showgirls! Oh, what a <laughs> what a film that was. It's hey? arguably my favorite film of all time. It is. Hey. Yeah, I'll, and I'll defend Frank's it to the stuff death. Stuff is closer in tone to Showgirls, I yes. would say, where it's it's that type of unconventional. So it's yeah. he's not clearly he's no Paul Ver- Verhoeven. But his instincts to like make a movie that packs a punch are the same. He yeah. just doesn't execute it very well almost ever. But well, he, sometimes he has sometimes no, Frank. He has no training. So I feel like with some training and some technical <laughs> skills, Frank could tighten things up a little bit and, and make it. Do you think he'd be open do you think he'd be a person open to something like that? Uh, no, because I feel like he would have done it by now <laughs> if he was going to. Plus, he's got all these movies under his belt. Exactly. He's proven. Yeah, I guess I so. can't stop thinking now with that murder in Sicilian Vampire <laughs> where the guy's just sleeping against the wall. He's just like leaned against a wall sleeping. <laughs> and then Frank wakes him up just to slit his throat with his fingernail. <laughs> and he goes, didn't we kill you? And then Frank kills him and goes, no, but I just killed you. 
That's oh, right. God. He kills two people after waking them up, yeah. and neither are in beds. They're both like against a wall or like hunched over a table. Yeah, well, what's his name? Uh, the Servino, Paul Servino, is just like asleep with a hoagie in his mouth or something like that. Like he's just <laughs> the roughest shirtless. Paul Servino's ever. Looked. Yeah, it's terrible. Mir- Mir- uh, Mira Servino is also in his movies too. So the whole Servino family she's is one. a part of it. They're just all in, hey. Yep, yeah, she's in a couple of them. I think she's in. She might be in the neighborhood as well. So, so Ooh. then would you say between the two, the movies and the music, which ones do you think he's been better at? At. <laughs> <laughs> Damn! If you, if you were to choose between the two, like if I could, if I had to get rid of one, or yep. if I just, oh boy, well, because you you can't, you can't get rid of the music, and you can't you can't get rid of either of them because they're so intermeshed. They're a part. He's of probably the been more successful it, but I'm just saying you with music. Do it. What is it? He's probably been more successful with music yeah. in that I could fashion together an album of songs that people would go, yeah, this is pl- like pleasant. Yeah. I don't know if anyone would be like, this is my new favorite artist, but people would be like, oh yeah, you can put that on while we're doing chores around the yeah. house or something like that. I, Whereas I don't know if I could splice together scenes of his movies no. that would make people be like, I got to check this guy out. No, definitely, right. definitely not. And like Frank, da- I, I like to play this uh, game with my uh, fiance where I'll, I'll just put on a Frank, da- I'll just put on Frank D'Angelo's music and not say anything about it. Yeah. And then just see how long it takes, how many songs it takes for her to go, is this Frank D'Angelo? And I <laughs> yeah, that's it. We got seven songs I can't in. Believe so it ever gets past one song. No, it when him just going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got, he's pretty distinct. I think the way um, you des- uh, described him was like a Tom Jones ripoff. Like you couldn't afford Tom Jones, yeah. So you get Frank D'Angelo Frank. to sing at your butt mitzvah or something. Oh yeah, for sure. He- <laughs> Um, what else do we, what else is there to talk about with Frank? God I damn. No, we've, we've skimmed the surface on a lot of these things. Like the thing that's really hard to capture just in conversation is his web presence. Yeah. Like the amount of Twitter accounts that he has that are just <laughs> the names of the characters from his movies. <laughs> <Yeah>. So like <laughs> Eddie Rizzo is the main character of the big fat stone. That's one of his Twitter accounts that to this day will retweet his tweets. Like he just utilizes these accounts to kind of give the vague impression of a community interaction. But even then it's so minimal that no one like you're, it's just a trick he's playing on himself really. Yeah. Cause he's not sure exactly how to do it anyway. So he thinks this is the best way to do it. Well, and none of those accounts have any followers to begin with. Right. Other than yeah, the other bot him. accounts. He's, yeah. He's, yeah. Like, yeah. He's just yeah. This. himself 20 times yeah. thinking, well, that looks better if someone were to stumble onto my page, but why would someone stumble onto your page? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's when I think he got the Trump idea, but like, yeah, he's always had this kind of connection with making things look good. Like he has a few YouTube videos that have in the high hundreds of thousands, maybe even a few with a million or, or more views. Oh, wow. So like maybe. he, he has, has a few, like he's made a bit of an imprint with things, but even then it's like you see the bot comments on it and you don't know quite how authentic it is. Mm-hmm. And it does, it clearly doesn't translate to anything. Mm-hmm. Like to be like, I have a million views on this video. Okay, but what about your last four videos and 10 tweets? They all have zero engagement. <laughs> <laughs> well, but this one's got a million, so. So do you mm-hmm. think he's like a broken clock then? Like yeah, every, every, like twice a day or twice in a year yeah, yeah. or whatever, like something strikes or twice in a lifetime something strikes. <sighs> oh. Oh, I don't think it's it, a, nothing's like, really struck yet. I don't think like okay. Frank hasn't had his at least in breakout relation, thing. At least in relation to Frank, twice an hour. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. It's here's the thing. There's enough talent surrounding Frank D'Angelo, and mm-hmm. Frank D'Angelo has enough instincts about these things mm-hmm. that I feel like he has the potential to make something great. I do think that there is one greatness inside of Frank D'Angelo somewhere, legitimately, mm-hmm. not just for fun, not us bullshitting about it. I do think that he could make a great album of songs or a great movie mm-hmm. given the right kind of people around him to help bolster that or the right kind of influence. Like Swizz Beats. Like Swizz Beats, yeah. If he had Swizz Beats on his songs, it's showtime. <laughs> you know, that's that's what that would, it would be. But I, he hasn't he hasn't gotten there yet. He hasn't found that yet, and I don't think he's going to. Uh, because his money, I don't know what's well, we going on with Frank. It's hard money. to know, but like we say, it feels like the the freight train is starting to run out of a little bit of steam here. Mm-hmm. And well, we we should, I mean, we should talk about this real quick here. Then, one of his chief financial backer for years and years and years <laughs> was Barry Sherman. Yep, who, the pharmaceutical billionaire. We talked about him in 2017. Barry and his wife Honey were murdered in their house. Oh, they, fuck. Were, they were murdered. Uh, what's his wife's name? Honey. Honey? That should be, that's a clue. Did you know that honey is also a word for money? <laughs> <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> I've been sitting here plugging coins into this jukebox, blah, 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 money. 
<laughs> you will have to listen to the winds of time to get that reference. That's right. <laughs> you will have to pay 50 American dollars to the Patreon if you want that. Yeah. Or just go to our <laughs> website. You want that stupid offhand remark to make sense. If you just, <laughs> just go to our website, goleatherdaddy.club.angelfire.com. Yeah. The RSS link Look is around. on there. Yeah, you'll find it. It's nothing. Don't worry about it. So um, Adam McGee will, <laughs> while you're there. Yeah, that's right. That prick. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, Barry so and his wife, his Barry wife, and his wife, yeah. honey, were murdered, and like, and Frank was like a he got he like Barry financed a lot of stuff for for Frank, mm-hmm. and so the concern is that like um, I also don't think uh, Barry had an up to date will, and Honey didn't have a will, mm-hmm. so and Barry's old will left a lot of stuff to Honey, and so there's all this these problems. The OPP have done a terrible job of investigating this case. They it's it's been like. It's been embarrassing to see how they've handled this thing. Um, they're missing obvious clues, not doing their due diligence. It's just, it's so bizarre that such an, like such a huge case, a billionaire was yeah. murdered. A Canadian billionaire. And, like, yeah. and it's, it's, nobody's talking about it. Nothing's coming up. I had no fucking idea until now. Exactly. And so, uh, and so. Well, cause didn't, it, it took them a while to call it a murder. Yeah, I it took them six like, months. They didn't even. Yeah, they, they waited a little bit and were like, maybe it's a suicide thing. Maybe it was a murder-suicide between the two of them, but like not considering outside suspects. Mm-hmm. And now I think they're finally at a point where they're in, but like that's why they're so far behind the case is because it took them a while to acknowledge the foul elements. Now, with all that said, I feel like Frank was one of the people shining a light on that, though. I think oh, yeah. he was kind of one of the voices being like, why aren't they investigating this shit? Exactly. Right. And he... he um well, hang on. I got I got some stuff. Well, I, yeah. There's some there's some quotes from Frank. Uh, well, actually, no. I, I okay. I do have to read these actually real quick. Yeah. So um, this is this is from an article called "The Unsolved Murder of an Unusual Billionaire" from uh, Matthew Campbell from Bloomberg. At least play no more blue behind it. Well, I no. We'll get in trouble for that. Uh, so this is this is a bit of a read here, but I, it's it's definitely worth it at the end. Sorry, so you're going to have to listen to Beautiful now to get that uh, that blue reference. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. this or is watch the Being Frank show. It's the theme song. Yep. Oh, there you go. You'll get it regardless. It's yeah. all in there. So uh, this is Frank talking about uh, you know what happened there. Uh, this this first quote will make sense though. Yep. They're fucking criminals. That's what they are. Frank D'Angelo said into his phone. He quickly hung up. Fucking banks, gangsters, and they say Italians are gangsters. We are. We were sitting at a corner table, backs to the wall, in an Italian restaurant at Toronto's Ritz Carlton Hotel. D'Angelo had asked me to meet him for an early lunch to discuss his relationship with Barry Sherman, his main financial backer for about fifteen years. Um, blah 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 blah. Uh, it was a regular. Oh, they talked, and uh, they talked not like. Uh, uh, a day a day or two before the bodies were discovered. Mm-hmm. So uh, it was a regular catch-up, D'Angelo recalled, entirely unremarkable in its content. And then here's, here's a nice quote from Frank. He was my best friend. He was my brother, he said, visibly choked up at the thought of Sherman's death. And I fucked him because I couldn't help him. I couldn't be there. Mr. Tough Guy, when he needed me the most, it destroys me. I can't even imagine what he felt. A waiter soon arrived to pour him a glass of Brunello, suggesting that the wine might need to breathe for a few minutes. Breathe my ass, D'Angelo said, raising the glass to his mouth. My mother had Brunello and Amaron on each tit. It was a little after 11.30 a.m. <laughs> what the fuck? If that doesn't say it all. I mean, that's a pretty good summation of who Frank D'Angelo is. Of wow. just the, the puzzle, of the intrigue that this man provides yeah. and his desire to be in the limelight and his desire to appear honest, but he holds back that which really would let you know who he is. Mm-hmm. He, he gives you these little glimpses at the man he wants to be, but we already know from his lyrics that he's somebody who fights with himself a lot. Mm. Well, I was going to say he against he and then he against the world. Oh, yeah, that exactly. Is a, that is a direct quote from one of his songs. You're the one. So really, it's him fighting himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, He hasn't self-actualized yet, is that is what we're saying? That's Yeah, that's a good way to put it, actually. Yes, and he will. Frank will blossom like a beautiful flower one of these do days. Do you think so, or will, do you think he'll implode? I think he'll probably implode. Well, but, uh, <laughs> without getting into too much detail of it, because this is not a place to, to, sure. to veer, yeah. Yeah. but there's been some personal things in his life that I think have brought him some joy, a sort yeah. of new lease on life, yeah. um, uh, from just from uh, his inner circle, mm-hmm. uh, has had some good elements to it. So, well, he surrounds himself And maybe that's where he's people. sort of diverting his focus, more inward, more to you know his his family and friends, and and maybe the, the outward good times have to slow down for a bit. Maybe yeah. uh, like all the gangster stories, you know, maybe that's a good way to look at it. Good the, pussy. The, with Frank, it all they they have their glory years, and then it starts to dry up for a little while, and they got to just reconcile, be an average people for a bit. Mm. And it's going to be tough for Frank. Maybe maybe Good Pussy is actually the story about Frank not being Frank. Ooh, 
Or maybe that's where the great album is going to come from, is yeah, from this yeah. period of like a little bit of introspection to be like, you know what, I've lived my whole life like I was a big shot, and now it's time to call it like like a really self-aware Frank D'Angelo album, it's, like an that Earl Sweatshirt it. style. It's, it's almost like yeah, <laughs> like it's almost like taking the real truth behind why he wrote Stupidest Angel. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just to appeal to the religious crowds. So, sure, yeah, sure. <laughs> you got to reach out to them. Yeah. Uh, I have I have some more quotes from that article that I think are just... Uh, Go that, for That other one was perfect, but I really like this one as well. Um, mm-hmm. So it goes, but like everyone in Sherman's orbit, he had his theories, like Frank had his theories, which he expressed Godfather style. <laughs> I think somebody came to make Barry an offer he couldn't refuse, and he refused, D'Angelo said, suggesting that someone wanted Sherman's cooperation, his money, or both, and that Sherman wouldn't yield. And Honey had to die because somebody felt she would get in the way of the scratch. I hate how he phrased that. The scratch. We were on to dessert, washed down with more wine, our second bottle. Money, he said, spitting on the floor with an audible spat. Fuck it. A few minutes later, we walked out of the hotel together. As we prepared to part ways, D'Angelo pulled me close. Do the right thing for my friend, he said. If you don't, I'm going to come to London and find you. So Damn. <laughs> and that's how like the article got, ends. It's got tones of that like Rolling Stone Johnny Depp article that just sort of shone a light on his sad existence in his big castle. <laughs> and now you've got this with Frank D'Angelo just kind of drinking wine at 11 in the morning and <laughs> spitting on the floor, fall, unraveling. It's so funny reading that because I've, I've consumed so much D'Angelo at this point. Mm-hmm. I can ex- I can picture exactly what that moment was like. Like I, I can see how he moved to spit on the floor. Yeah. It's just like it's crystal clear in my head how, how he moved and who he is, I, maybe I'll become a D'Angelo impersonator. I don't know. It's a heavy topic for him, though. I mean, mm-hmm. we're talking about his good friend, and he's worried that justice won't be certain. At the at the time, it certainly did. There wasn't much indication that people gave a shit, and they're yeah. still not. That so. article came out in 2018, and not much has changed since then. Although a nope. book just recently came out about the Sherman murders mm-hmm. that shines absolutely no light on anything and doesn't offer any new information. But you does, know, does it's this, cashing but in. somebody made some cash. Damn right. Uh, Fuck m- it. Not to sound like a dick, but does this seem to be some type of I, maybe poetic justice for the way that the assault cases were handled, because oh, those seem to be. No, canceled. I don't want to say that. Oh, I don't. I don't want to. No, cut, cut, <laughs> cut that out. Cut that out, Jurassic. So you don't want to be on record saying stuff like that. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I'm not saying. I'm not saying it's the truth. I'm just saying it seems like it's just more like an iron, an irony thing. It's right? there's like, a certain yeah. There, there's a side to that original case that would be like looking at it in this similar va- way that D'Angelo is looking at this one now mm. based on, like, I'm not saying that no, one no, is no, true God, or the other. No, I'm no. saying that there was another side to both sides that mm. are like looking at it almost at the exact same way. Mm. That's all I'm saw, talking about. I mean, well, I think there's, there's certainly an irony to the idea that Frank kind of wants to present himself as honest in his work, presents a kind of glorified version of crime much of the time. Mm-hmm. But uh, he's also sympathetic uh, to many criminals. And now his own personal life yields the consequences of kind of that sort of lifestyle. Yeah. There's certainly an irony to be had there. Well, and he also, and that's where present- again, Frank remains so interesting. So many of these things just stack neatly into the puzzle of him. Yeah. And as an outside viewer, you almost make more sense of him than he's making of himself. Mm-hmm. But there's, Hmm. But he keeps putting things out that give you clues that he doesn't even understand. Well, here's a nice quote from one of his friends, Phil Esposito. Oh, yeah. uh, About his uh, hockey playing skills. Mm Mm-hmm. He isn't a bad. Go- <laughs> is this a good one to put a pin in the topic? I think so. <laughs> is yeah. this the perfect wrap up quote about Frank? His well, hockey skills. I mean, we're talking about of how- all the things we could say about Frank. <laughs> the man had a mean wrist shot. <laughs> <laughs> well, he wasn't a he wasn't a forward. He was a goalie. But uh, he no. said, uh, Phil Esposito says he isn't a bad goalie at all. Of course, we like to bust his balls a little bit. I try to shoot at his crotch. Try to get him peeing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Uh, I really like the beer. I really like Frank. We've become really good friends. To tell you the truth, the guy's okay. The so, guy's okay. <laughs> high, high praise from Phil Esposito about, so, about well, his friend Frank D'Angelo. So at the end of the day, like when it comes down to it, when you're looking, when you're when you're talking about the Frank D'Angelo experience, yeah. it's like the guy's okay. The guy's okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Frank did uh, Frank did perform at the roast of Phil Esposito. Oh yeah, he and did. Yeah, the amount of jokes that he performed that were out of a joke book and had nothing to do with Phil Esposito would be the entirety of his set. <laughs> Just like <laughs> three story jokes and good night. And the crowd loved him for it. They loved it the kind of old fashioned entertainment that he brought to the table. That's probably the night he got the idea for the joke thief, where mm. he was like, "Well, what's wrong? As long as everybody's entertained, why can't I just take it from a joke book?" That's outstanding. I, That's so funny. The the I think the most interesting uh, the most interesting thing to me about Frank D'Angelo 
is the way everybody talks about him. Right. All of the, like, you can look at the, the movies, you can look objectively at all the stuff that he's done, mm-hmm. the court cases, everything, all the stuff that makes up the Frank D'Angelo story, but everyone around him sings his praises and talks about what a great guy he is, except Philip Zidou who said he's just okay, but <laughs> he talk, but they all, they all just talk about, like, how, like, everyone should have a friend like Frank D'Angelo. Like, right. And, like, everybody should have a Frank D'Angelo in their life, and I just... I just need to know why. I need to understand. I think he prides himself on like putting out like messages that he cares. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a, a, he's got, I bet he's got a real Olive Garden mentality. When you're here, you're family. (laughs) I think you mean Ricky's when you're here, you're home. That's, uh, but, uh, one, like one of the articles I read, which I'm not going to quote here, but he, um, the guy talks about how he, he went to Frank's to like, to, for the filming of the joke thief, this, uh, this, um, and he said that the whole time he was there, Frank was just being so congenial to him and so friendly. Yeah. He was like, Hey, eat, eat, eat the chicken Parmesan. Like, Hey, let's get this guy more wine. Like he was taking care of this mm-hmm. guy. And then during the filming of the show went fine. And then they did a, a, they did a recording of the being Frank show. And during the recording of the being Frank show, one of the stage hands uh, tripped on like the curtain for the, like one of the, the side stages and the curtain fell down and Frank screamed at this guy in front of everybody there yeah. and then proceeded to shit talk him for the entirety of the show <laughs> and just rag on this guy. And then at the end of the show afterwards, he, he approached, Frank approached this uh, reporter and was like, it's pretty, do you see how I like, uh, how, how much restraint I showed when I talked about that guy? I was pretty restrained. I was pretty, you know, I kind of let him off pretty easy. I think there, you know, for what he did. And the guy's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Jesus. So there's I, a couple moments like that on the being Frank show. There's one where his cousin from real gangsters mm-hmm. and him have a fake fight, like trying to do like an Andy Kaufman style thing where they just start going at each other and they stand up yelling at each other and then they turn to the audience and they're like, gotcha, even though everyone in the crowd can tell it's a fake argument. <laughs> like it's just this uncomfortable exercise they're going through. And then there's another one that I haven't seen. I've just seen a little snippet of, but it's where the guy who plays, and this is his role in the movie, I'm pretty sure, of uh, of Real Gangsters, is Mr. Indonesian Cocksucker. <laughs> the, um, the money man, the banker. We control that the money. Actor, is on the Being Frank show and he gets into a verbal sparring match with Frank and Frank kicks him the hell off. Really? And I've just seen the clip of him being like, you can get off the show then if you're going to talk to me like that on my own program. Whoa. <laughs> and I can't find the full interview to tell if it's a bit or not, but there certainly seems to be a lot of antagonism well, on, on his talk show, which I think is great. That's what's lacking yeah. from Fallon. And that guy also hasn't really appeared in other Frank D'Angelo movies since then. Like, I, don't I feel remember. like he, he was in uh, Big Fat Stone. He was yep. in, I don't know. Real Gangsters. But, yeah, exactly. But I, I wonder, yeah, Bad Blood. How do we, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how do we veer this to a conclusion? Yeah. Oh, no, I was, I was just going to say like this, the, that definitely kind of ties into the fact that he's got a, a Trump thing going on. Where yes. He's real, like he wants to appear as good as possible to the people that he thinks are of worth. Mm-hmm. And yet to people like that stagehand, it just doesn't really matter. He wants to show that he has power. And over, over, you know, the week. I'll put mm. it that way, which is ironic. And in his defense, fuck that stagehand. Yeah, do your fucking job. <laughs> this is the lift being it. Frank show. Yeah, lift your you know feet. This is the real world. You know, world, they're not going to be able to edit around that. <laughs> this is the real world. Okay, we can't mess around. It's going out live. People are watching this paid advertising. Yeah. It's not. We can't go back. So then, what would you guys say as a conclusion for your experience on your Frank Dan- D'Angelo st- like journey? What would kind of be like, I don't know, maybe a, a, an end game that you're reaching or to, to anybody that has no idea. Obviously, they've sat here, they th- they listened to this. And oh, I think I it's, know, it's clear. But like for is. you guys, what has it done for you? What has oh. this journey been for you? Well, what were you going to say, Garrett? Oh, I, sorry. I thought I thought you meant more kind of the goal. And I was going to say the oh, goal absolutely is some sort of collaboration. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We want to work <laughs> Despite with- Despite everything you've heard. Yeah, yeah. I really think- that we understand him well enough yeah. that we could find a way to better aim his projects and money. Like mm-hmm. if you have things you want to achieve, you've got some dead weight methods that if you just lost this shit and leaned into different shit, you could at least become a sort of weirdo, a more well-known weirdo. No, he doesn't want that because it's not good for his brand. Some respect, yeah. Right. But th- you could do something and I would sincerely love to just like take a meeting with him mm-hmm. Which would be impossible at this point because he would hate our guts to, to figure out who we are and make him hate us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but what true. he doesn't realize is that it's like, I don't hate the stuff you make, Frank. I mean, I kind of – it's weird. It's the weirdest relationship to have with yeah. content. Yeah. 
I would I would love to pitch him things, pitch him movies, pitch him ideas, pitch him stories, and then watch him create something out of that pitch. Right. And have like kind of go a little bit hands off, but maybe just like as a consultant, give him tips here and there. Like Garrett said, trim the fat. But like give a script to the actors <clears throat> or something just to yeah. tighten the screws a little bit. That so okay, hey, you don't want to write things down. Well, we'll write down a few ideas for you, and you can keep your method of just kind of rolling with things, and don't give us credit as writers. That's fine. You no, can still put written that. by Frank D'Angelo. It's all you. Yep. Yeah, and, but, and eventually herald in the actual self-realization of Frank D'Angelo. Yeah, and also be in his movies. I want to be in a Frank D'Angelo movie more than anything. I want to be – I don't even care what I do. He can kill me. I don't care what he does in it. He can rip my balls off, shove them down my throat. I don't care. But I just want to be a part of that process. I want to be there. I want to meet you know, Danny Aiello before he inevitably dies, yep. and I want to just be a part of that. So, Frank, if you're listening, hit us up. Send a message to fingered11 at gmail.com. I can skate if you're going to do a last big save sequel. I can skate as well as the guys did in the game. I can't skate, but I can, I, I, I can I, say I can keep fuck. up with that pace of play. Yeah. <laughs> I can hang out with Dominique Swain. How's that sound? I'm cool. I'm down with that. So, um, Interesting. I, as far as like what I, what I would want from this is like I want people to discover Frank D'Angelo. I mm-hmm. want people to get into him as much as we're into him. I want, like, it's fun having a little secret. Like, it's fun having a secret thing that you know is just yours, like Frank D'Angelo or someone like GBB. But, um, but like, to, to, to have it blow up, to have it just become, to have people talking about him, to be able to say Frank D'Angelo and have people go, yeah, oh, of course, the filmmaker, oh, yeah, or, oh, yeah. the musician, oh, instead of being like, who the fuck is that? Is that the guy you're always talking about? Can you shut the fuck up about him? Yeah. No. Can you turn this music off? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's the soundtrack to my life. But, yeah, I just, I want I want more exposure for him. I want people to know who he is. That would be a, uh, I would love for him to win a Juno. That's what I would really love. <laughs> like the artist that he has that perform for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't kid yourselves, people. His albums, he's got Juno award winning musicians. Uh, nominated. Are, or nominated. sorry, nominated musicians that yeah. like Shiloh. perform in his albums. So <laughs> just, uh, you know. Um, gentlemen, closing thoughts. Uh, or were those there's the no way anyone's listening at this point. That's my closing thought. Yeah, sorry if you made it all this way. I don't know if this was good. I don't know what. I don't know how, <laughs> if we sold it, dude. It's the way that it rolls. We just roll. We put the information out there and we see how it happens. Yeah, don't worry too much about it. Well, thanks for having us on the show. Like yeah. this was super fun, and I any chance I get to talk about Frank D'Angelo, I'm going to take that chance. So, hey man, thanks for letting uh, let me use your studio. Oh, hey, no Little problem. Co- collaboration well, we plug on our, our show, forms. though. Eh? Yeah, so Fuck yeah, we should. Where, so where can people find more? Find your show where you guys talk about all things Frank. <laughs> okay. Uh, so if you want to find out more about us and what we do, search for the official Goatsy podcast. We're on uh, all podcasting apps. Uh, we We're have all a- over the web, but we do have an official website. Yep. We have an official website. It's really easy to get to. You just go to W, uh, you don't, don't go to www, go to HTTP colon backslash backslash go leather daddy dot club dot angel dot com. And there you'll find everything you need. All the official Goatsy podcast stuff is on our Angel Fire website. And it's just, it's easy to use. You just scroll. There's links. We have a YouTube page. We have a Pornhub page. We have uh, our SoundCloud page. Our, the and patron. The patron, We have a link yeah. to our patron somewhere on our uh, website. It's yeah. hidden. But if you can find it, you get free Patreon episodes. That's right, you it might just, just be under the picture of McGee. But. It is. Yeah, it's directly under the picture of McGee. But <laughs> uh, but yeah, and we also have a Patreon that you can go to. You can pay $5 a month to get uh, – there. we have 49 episodes on there of various things. There's a ton of dog shit on there now, yeah. And that's where the Frank D'Angelo deep dives are. Yep. We're also doing a similar deep dive into Dane Cook. Yep. And we, a future plan deep dive into Prozac. Yep. So we got Frankie D's cocksuckers, Dane Cox cooksuckers, and soon to be Cox sucks to be you. Our, our Proja- Prozac deep dive, as well as various other things. We also have just regular like other bonus episodes of the yeah, official lots of bonus podcast. episodes, lots of bullshit, mm-hmm. lots yeah, of lot tasteless of, humor. Yeah. If you if you like if you yeah. <laughs> if you're a fucking piece of shit, you'll love our shit. So, <laughs> and you do the story of you podcast. I also do the story of you podcast. Whatever, that's a thing. That's a thing. I'm genuinely proud of, and I like. I'm proud of it, and I'm happy I do it. But uh, whatever, you guys can find it. Story of you, the letter U. Storyofyoupodcast.com. Check it out there. All kinds. Of, all the links are there. So uh, you'll love it. Jurassic episode was episode 151, I believe, is what you said. Or 151, 152. 152. Yeah, one yeah. Of those so two. not not too long ago. Nope. And uh, it was a great one. And we just, we all kinds of great stuff. Other members of the Saskatchewan Podcast Network have been on there, Boozy from the Terror Table, and yeah, you yeah. know, other people from other shows. And uh, yeah, you know, it's just a fun interview show where I interview people about their life story and the colors of their life. So um, so yeah, it's it's it's, it's yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Check that out too. Not as fun as this show, but uh, you know, it's a good time. Garrett, anything else? 
No, that's it for me. That's it. That's it. Mahalo, right. folks. Yeah, Mahalo. When you hear your home. Yeah. Well, I again, I want to thank uh, thank Sean for letting us use his studio, his newly built, put together studio, which is a lot more professional than ours. <laughs> uh, and uh, the first Skype of the F word history in two and a half years, which is awesome. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at the F words G. You can email us at the F word podcast at gmail.com. Make sure you're following and enter- uh, the, I keep saying entertain facts, the F word on Instagram, the lazy Canadian on Instagram. Uh, and um, yeah, that's it. I'm G that was Sean and Garrett and we are out.